Have you ever wondered what's inside the Great Pyramid? Or where the Oracle of Delphi spoke? Explore Muse.org to step virtually into ancient worlds from anywhere. Discover the wonders of Egypt's tombs, Greece's temples and more through immersive worlds and historic simulations, using technology to bring the past to life. Start your adventure at Muse.org today. Hello, I'm Ryan Stitt, and welcome back to the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 111, The Spartan Hegemony. The Spartans allegedly went to war to free the Greeks, and the irony of that is really quite extraordinary. Xenophon ends his account of the Peloponnesian War, with the Spartans zealously tearing down the walls of Athens to the music of flute girls, and everybody believing that this represented the beginning of freedom for the Greeks. But Xenophon, who was writing about this many years later, knew perfectly well that this was an illusion, because Spartan power, which had grown to an unprecedented degree in the course of the war, and was now seemingly almost unchecked, would present the Spartans with newfound internal and external problems and opportunities over how they were to conduct themselves within their city-state and how they were to rearrange the structure of power in the Greek world, including their relations to Persia. In terms of foreign policy, the Spartans were presented with three possibilities in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War. First, they could have done what they knew best, which was to confine themselves to the Peloponnesus and to continue maintaining their control of the Peloponnesian League. This was traditional Spartan foreign policy over the last two centuries, primarily due to the fear of a helot uprising. However, changes had taken place in Sparta during the course of the Peloponnesian War, of which the most important was the appearance of a lot of money in the hands of Spartans, something that was supposedly forbidden in Spartan society. This had been made available both by the Persians for wartime purposes and by booty seized from some very prosperous cities held by the Athenians. In fact, upon Lysander's return to Sparta, he brought back 470 talons of silver that he received from Cyrus to conduct the war and handed it out to the people. The presence of that kind of wealth caused many conservatives to fear that Spartan involvement outside the Peloponnesus would undermine those traditions which they valued so much and which were part of their identity that caused them to feel superior to other peoples. One of the Spartan kings, Pausanias, appears to have favored this position, though with the caveat that he did not necessarily oppose some, albeit limited, ventures abroad. In fact, we see in 403 BC how he and the other Spartan king, Aegis, liberated Delos from Athenian rule and made an alliance with the Delians. However, this action, which aimed at reducing Athenian maritime and ceremonial influence, was about as far as Pausanias wished to go. Secondly, the Spartans could use this newfound power and the money that went with it to govern and to exploit opportunities outside the Peloponnesus. That choice was divided into two. At the extreme, the Spartans had it in their power to contest the Persians for control of the entire Greek world in the east, meaning the Aegean, the coast of Asia Minor, the Hellespont, and the waters beyond. The Persians, otherwise, would have controlled them now that the Athenians were out of the way. In a certain sense, the Spartans who took this point of view had it in mind to take the place of Athens as the great imperial power in the Aegean and beyond. The chief figure here was Lysander the admiral had been responsible for winning the war. He strove to establish what amounted to a Spartan empire, a sort of political and military dominion that scholars, in line with ancient usage, have commonly called a hegemony. On the other hand, although other Spartans, quite possibly King Aegis, favored a hegemonic Spartan foreign policy, they were not as extreme as Lysander, and instead opted for a middle policy between the aggressive and conservative stances. Ultimately, they did not want to be confined to the Peloponnesus, 
but also did not want to engage in a grandiose plan of supplanting Athenian imperial power, which would eventually lead them into conflict with the Persians again. Also, they were deterred by the prospect of having to maintain a fleet because there was no way to pursue this aggressive policy without one that approached the power of the Athenians when it was at its strongest. This also meant they would have to rely on rowers and naval tactics rather than the traditional Spartan military advantage of hoplite soldiers fighting infantry battles. As a result, this would have meant relying on non-Spartiates for the success of such a mission. Not wishing for this, those who favored a middle policy instead desired only to keep Sparta as the hegemon on the Greek mainland outside the Peloponnesus, which they could control with their infantry. Also, taking advantage of Athens being knocked out as a rival in central Greece, Thebes not only now was the dominant regional power in Boeotia, but had grown into a considerable potential challenge for the Spartans, as there was a very real chance that Thebes could seek to supplant Athens as a power who could sit equally at the table with the Spartans, rather than subordinate to them. And so, some Spartans feared that if they simply stayed put in the Peloponnesus, Thebes would become the master of Attica and of central Greece and suddenly, they would become a real menace to the Spartans, which is exactly what would happen. And so, those were the three courses of action that the Spartans could take following the end of the Peloponnesian War. The man of the hour in 404 BC, though, was Lysander, the war's great victor, and so his aggressive stance would have a lot of influence on what happened next. His let's conquer it all policy, though, was very much personal, and who Lysander was made a great deal of difference. He was not a pure, legitimate Spartiate, but a Mothax, meaning he had a Spartan father and a non-Spartan mother. As a result, although he was brought up as a Spartan, he was not a Spartiate. But in the last years of the war, he rose to be a general and was put in command of Spartan forces. How was this possible? Well, as we have seen, he was a man of extraordinary ambition. And the ancient writers tell us that he had developed the notion of actually bringing about a revolution in Sparta and changing the constitution in such a way that would allow him to effectively become its sole ruler and therefore eliminate the diarchy. Well, if he were going to be able to accomplish anything like that, he would need to have a military command, the money, and supporters of every kind. And so his policy for Sparta was very much a policy that fit his needs. It is believed that the Spartans, as stipulated in the so-called Treaty of Boeotius with the Persians, which we discussed in episode 106, removed their armed forces from Asia Minor after the Athenians surrendered and the war came to an end. This did not mean, though, that the Spartans gave up all connections with their Greek cousins out east. According to Diodorus, whenever Lysander liberated a Greek city in Asia Minor from the Athenian Empire, in establishing Spartan control, he set up oligarchies in some cities and decarchii in others. A decarchia was a brutal, narrower oligarchy of ten men chosen from the local people. These ten men had full political power vested in them. It is impossible to know, due to a lack of evidence, which of the two constitutions was more widespread or how they differed in operation. But it is believed that the Decarchii were more common since Plutarch records that they were filled with men who were the personal supporters of Lysander. To ensure their safety from pro Athenian revolts, a Peloponnesian garrison was also placed in that city. It was led by a Spartan commander called a Harmostes, or Harmost for short. When Athens surrendered, the Harmosts and the garrisons in Asia Minor would have been removed, but not the Decarchii which were all filled with Lysander's creatures, not anybody with independent power or influence. In fact, we have coins dating to around 405 to 400 BC that are best attributed to supporters of Lysander in several eastern Greek cities. On the obverse, they have images with Heracles strangling two snakes, and the letters Sigma, Upsilon, and Nu for Symmachicon, or Alliance, and the city's normal design is on the reverse. This newly founded Spartan Empire differed from the Athenian Empire in various ways. The Delian League, which morphed into the Athenian Empire, started out as a voluntary association with a very clear common purpose, to liberate those Greeks who were still under Persian rule 
and to preserve their freedom from their Persian neighbors and former conquerors. On the other hand, this new empire under Lysander had no purpose and was not voluntary in any shape, manner, or form. In fact, the Spartans effectively betrayed the Asiatic Greeks because they put them under Spartan rule instead of liberating them, as was promised. Plutarch records that the 4th century BC historian Theopompus likened the Spartans to tavern women because they gave the Greeks a very pleasant sip of freedom and then dashed the wine with vinegar, a taste that was harsh and bitter. That's because Lysander allowed the people to be masters of their affairs, but at the same time, he put their cities into the hands of the boldest and most contentious oligarchs. In many cases, these decarchii, established by Lysander, were tyrannical and greedy. In addition to collecting money for the official payments that they had to make to the Spartans, the decarchii also stole whatever they could from their people. According to Diodorus, this mounted to about a thousand talents a year, roughly equivalent to the same that was given to the Athenians. As one of our ancient sources writes, the will of any Spartan was regarded as law in these subject cities. For this reason, the Harmosts and the Deciarchii elicited near universal hatred from their subjects. In fact, Isocrates states that they were so obviously unjust that to enumerate their crimes would be a redundant exercise. As you can imagine, due to his victories against the Athenians and this system of Decarchii, Lysander was able to amass a huge fortune, and he brought these riches home to Sparta. For centuries, the possession of money was supposedly illegal in Sparta, but the newly minted navy required funds, and Persia could not be trusted to maintain financial support, so money was now a necessity. Plutarch records, though, that some of the more conservative Spartans pushed back against all of this money coming into Sparta for fear of its power to corrupt their citizens, just as Lycurgus had once warned against. In particular, they had witnessed firsthand the fall from grace of Gallippus, the hero of the Athenian defeat at Syracuse, due to the corrupting power of money, as we described in episode 107. As a result, some of them pled with the ephors to purify the city of all of its silver and gold, and therefore get them back on the path that Lycurgus had intended. At the same time, some eminent conservative Spartans even censured Lysander. Never one to remain on the defensive, though, he doggedly fought back by publicly attacking and humiliating Nauclitus, a supporter of Pausanias and one of the five ephors who were elected for 404 BC ostensibly because of the man's obesity, and therefore, his failure to lead a purely austere Spartan life. Nothing further is heard of the incident. Nauclitus went unpunished, but he did vanish from the record. At the same time, Lysander's victory did not enhance his own position, as many Spartans were not happy to see an ephor humiliated in such a shameful fashion, especially one who had done nothing to harm the state. Lysander's conduct in this manner led many Spartans further to suspect that he was reckless and self-serving, a person whose own advancement overrode the welfare of Sparta. Still, the matter of what to do about the money needed to be decided. After deliberating on the matter, the ephors decided not to allow any gold and silver coinage into the city, but not to bar it from being used by Spartans outside of Sparta. Lysander's friends, though, opposed this measure and insisted that money should remain in the city. Ultimately, it was resolved that money could be introduced for public use only, and if any private person were to be found in possession of it, they would be punished with death. The topic of the existence of wealth in Sparta is complicated because of late and often hostile sources and the surprising complexity of the Spartan economy. But scholars tend to push back now against the traditional view that gold and silver money for private use had ever been eradicated at Sparta. The truth appears to be that, although Sparta did not issue coins, possession had not previously been banned. Whatever the case, the religiously pious Spartans used some of the spoils from this war to set up lavish dedicatory offerings to the gods, and the compromise effectively was based on the economic reality of the time. The Spartans had won an empire, which they could not effectively administer without coinage that was of generally recognized value, meaning gold and silver, and therefore they would need to have some, at least for public use. 
Since Lysander was at the height of his power and influence, he reached heights that no mortal had ever reached in the Greek world before him. According to Plutarch, during the aforementioned lavish dedicatory offerings to the gods, he received the extravagant honor of the so-called Navarch's dedication at Delphi. Placed at the beginning of the Sacred Way, immediately before the Athenian Monument for Marathon, it was a large group of bronze statues, and in the foreground was Lysander, bearded with his hair long in Spartan fashion, crowned by Poseidon, and flanked by his two admirals. He further adorned the monument with the dedicatory epigram proclaiming that, by his victory at Agos Potami, he had crowned Sparta as the Acropolis of Greece. Likewise, in a treasury dedicated to Brasidas by the Acanthians, Lysander placed golden stars to the Dioscori and a one meter long trireme made of golden ivory that Cyrus had given to him as a prize for his victory. The sheer size and attractiveness of these offerings were meant to impress and were hardly the gift of an ordinary Spartan. More politically ominous were the honors granted to him by Eastern Greeks, which provided unmistakable evidence of the loyalties that he had cultivated and which could be interpreted as more of his than of Sparta. For example, the oligarchs whom he had restored to power in Samos loved him so much and were so grateful for what he had done that they held religious ceremonies on the island and literally worshipped Lysander as a god. In fact, the 4th century BC historian Doris of Samos records that they voted for their festival of Hera to be renamed the Lysandria after him. This was the first time in Greek history that anybody had received such treatment. He was also the first known Greek with songs of triumph written about him, as he took poets on his campaigns to eulogize his victories and promote his self-image. One paean in particular sings of him as the general over all of Greece. Although this occurred quite frequently in myth, these types of honors made him one of the first historical Greeks to seriously challenge the boundary between men and gods. And what generally happened when something like that occurred in myth? That's right, the gods would humble the person. On the one hand, while all of this elevated Lysander's influence and power, it also presented a problem for the more conservative aristocrats of Sparta and most particularly with the kings. It was especially disturbing for them to see that this Mothax was being worshipped as a god, and of course, that kind of eminence was unheard of for a non-king in the Spartan world. Naturally, this led to envy and contempt, and Plutarch reports that Aegis responded jealously with a dedication of his own in which he claimed to be king of land and sea. But on the other hand, Lysander's ambition was blatantly obvious and ruthless, and at least according to Plutarch, there was no moderation to his personality, much like with Alcibiades. Plutarch even writes that Lysander thought nothing of cheating boys with dice and men with oaths. In this political thicket, Lysander stood in a very delicate position. Without a magistracy, he was subjected to the laws as any other citizen, and in reality, while he may have possessed authority, He didn't have any real power back in Sparta, and he even began to sully his own reputation by unintentionally provoking such hatred, jealousy, resentment, and fear that something bad would happen to the Spartan way of life, and perhaps even to the Spartan constitution. But nothing could be done about him at the moment, so Pausanias and his traditionalists were forced to bide their time and wait for the right opportunity to puncture a hole in his ambitions. Meanwhile, as he was stirring up all sorts of resentment back in Sparta, Lysander himself was off in Thrace. Diodorus and Plutarch both record how Pharnabasis, the Persian satrap of Hellespontine Phrygia, also grew outraged by Lysander because he had pillaged his territory, so he sent men to Sparta to denounce him. The ephors were incensed, and when they found Thorax, one of his friends and fellow generals, with money in his private possession, which supposedly was against Spartan law, They put him to death and sent a dispatch to Lysander, ordering him home. When he received this order, Lysander was very worried. Since he feared the denunciations of Pharnabasis above all others, he opted to go to the Persian satrap's court and beg him to write another letter about him to the ephors, stating that the first was a mistake and that he had no complaints against him. However, Lysander here misjudged his opponent. 
Farnabasis, after promising to do all that Lysander had requested, openly wrote such a letter as Lysander demanded, but secretly kept another by him that was already written. And when he put on the seals, he exchanged the documents, which looked exactly alike, and gave Lysander the one which had been secretly written. Accordingly, when Lysander arrived at Sparta, he gave the ephors the letter of Farnabasis, and was convinced that the greatest of the complaints against him would now be removed. But when the ephors read the letter and showed it to him, he quickly realized that he was in hot water. The ephors too were in a quandary. They could ill afford to offend such a powerful friend as Farnabasis and his master, the Persian king Artaxerxes. But they could not readily replace a man of Lysander's ability, connections, and experience. Fortunately for them, Lysander, with his usual wile, solved the problem himself. According to Plutarch, he made up the excuse that he had to go to the Oracle of Zeus Amun in the Siwa Oasis of the great desert of Libya and give a sacrifice to the god on account of some vow that he had made for his assistance in his battles in Thrace. But he really feared that the Ephors would decide against him if he stayed in Sparta too long. When combined with the account of Diodorus, it seems that he may have wished to bribe the Oracle for some sort of assistance. Either way, after much contemplation, the Ephors allowed him to set sail. After all, the Spartans were a deeply religious people and weren't going to say no for a visit to a temple. According to Diodorus, it was later discovered that Lysander had schemed ways to increase his power at the expense of the Spartan kings. There is an argument among scholars as to whether this was an invention to discredit him after his death, though the plot does fit with what we know of Lysander. And again, the comparison to Alcibiades here is not a bad one. In any case, Diodorus reports that he wished to end the dual kingship of the two Heraclidae clans and instead make every Spartan eligible. This would allow for the strongest candidate, regardless of birth, to put forth a claim, and naturally, he would have lobbied to be chosen because of his achievements. If this plan should fail, he wished at least for the army's leadership not to be automatically given to a Spartan king. But he preferred the former because it would allow him to hold the military functions that belonged to the kings for a term of life, and therefore, he would no longer be able to be deposed or recalled such as he was at the end of his one-year terms of office. Naturally then, in the hands of a man like Lysander, this permanent office might become something very different from what it was in the hands of the hereditary kings, as the proportion of power between the kings and the ephors would have considerably shifted. But he needed to wait for the right time to act on these ambitions, and most importantly, he needed to ensure that he had the support of certain powerful people, he had already taken care to court some of the ephors by filling Sparta's coffers with the wealth of plundered cities. He also undertook preparations to persuade the citizen body by commissioning a man named Cleon of Halicarnassus to write him a dazzling speech that he would commit to memory and recite to the people at the appropriate time. It was this speech that was supposedly found later. In any case, Lysander knew that clever rhetoric would not help him unless he first terrified and subdued his countrymen with religious fear and superstitious terror. Knowing that the Spartans paid a great deal of attention to an oracle's responses, he attempted to bribe the priestess of Delphi to give an oracular response that was favorable to his designs. However, he could not win over her attendance, despite the large sum of money that he promised them so he made a second attempt to do the same with the Oracle of Dodona in Epirus, but he met no success there either. Therefore, it was the Oracle of Zeus Amun that he needed to turn to next, and this is likely why he needed to go to Libya rather than the reason he gave the ephors. Libus, a king of some unspecified region in Libya, had been a guest friend of Lysander's father. In fact, it was because of this reason that Lysander's brother was named Libus. And so, with the king's help and the large sum of money that he brought, Lysander believed that he could win over the oracle of Zeus Amun. But as at Delphi and Dodona, he was definitely mistaken. Disappointed, he sailed back to Sparta. At the same time, in his absence, the Spartans became aware of the individual power that he had begun to gather abroad with his Decarchii. Shortly after he arrived in Sparta, Ambassadors from the Oracle of Zeus Amun also laid charges against him for attempted bribery. He was immediately put on trial, 
but he presented a persuasive defense of his conduct and was acquitted. At this point, the Spartans still did not know of his intent to change the constitution to allow kings to be elected from all citizens. Even though he convinced them of his innocence, his reputation had taken a major hit. But luckily for Lysander, as we discussed in episode 108, it was at this time that the Athenians had engaged in their civil war in 403 BC. Lysander saw this as the perfect opportunity to get out of Sparta and repair his reputation. So he tried to persuade the Spartan authorities to let him lead an army to Athens. However, the conservative faction, who had now grown particularly fearful of Lysander's intentions, especially feared the repercussions of allowing him to capture Athens a second time. So they opted to send King Pausanias at the head of the expedition instead. Lysander joined him, but he wasn't in charge. After Pausanias brought reconciliation to the whole affair, he returned to Sparta. Unsurprisingly, he was brought to trial before the Garrosia and the Ephors on the charge of treason, no doubt some drummed-up charge brought by the supporters of Lysander. In any case, Pausanias was narrowly acquitted, and the breakdown of the final vote is known, a rare occurrence in Spartan history. The 28 Garantes voted evenly at 14 apiece, so it was up to King Aegis to split the deadlock. But shockingly, he voted against his royal colleague. Although Pausanias and Aegis had worked together to reduce Lysander's power, Aegis's shift here has long been debated by historians. Perhaps he was showing his displeasure with Pausanias' leniency of Athens, as he himself supported a more hardline approach. Nonetheless, Pausanias was then saved by the five Evors, who unanimously voted in his favor. But the reason behind this support is unknown. They presumably agreed with Pausanias' settlement that allowed Sparta to control Athens without intervening too much in its affairs. In addition, on the orders of the Ephors, around the Aegean, Lysander's Dacarchiae were deposed and replaced by Patrioi Politeiae, or their traditional constitutions. In essence, while the Spartans were claiming to restore the management of each city's affairs to its own people, the Dacarchiae were replaced with pro-Spartan oligarchies whose leaders maintained their power through friendly relationships with local Spartan harmosts and garrisons. Even still, Lysander's influence in Spartan foreign policy was not completely wiped away. As we discussed in episode 110, the following year, in 402 BC, when Lysander's close friend Cyrus prepared to revolt against Artaxerxes, the Persian prince not only employed a Spartan named Clearchus, who became the principal commander of his mercenaries, but the Spartan authorities back home agreed to send a substantial contribution of 700 hoplites and another commander named Cyrus Sophos. So at least because of his relationship with Cyrus, Lysander continued to hold some influence. Also, in 402 BC, the Spartans attempted to restore their complete control over the Peloponnesus and to settle some old grudges by bringing several charges against the polis of Elis, which was located in the peninsula's northwestern corner. If you recall from episode 98, the Spartans' main grievances were that the Elians had made an anti-Spartan alliance with the Athenians, Argives, and Mantineans after the Peace of Nicias, and had prevented the Spartans from competing in the Olympic Games and sacrificing there during the festival. In addition, at some point later, the Spartan king Aegis had been sent to the Temple of Zeus at Olympia to sacrifice for victory in the war in accordance with an oracle, and the Elians once again forbade him from making his sacrifice since he was waging war against other Greeks. So he was forced to depart. Angered by all of these insults, now that the war with Athens was over, the Ephors and the Assembly resolved to teach the Elians a lesson in how to behave moderately and to get their retribution. They first sent ambassadors to Elis to announce that they must allow their subject cities to be independent and to pay back their quota for the cost of the war. When the Elians refused their demands and even accused the Spartans of enslaving the Greeks, the Ephors mobilized the army. Xenophon and Diodorus, through Ephorus, provide two very different accounts of the Spartan Elian War. According to Diodorus, Pausanias was sent out for one campaign with an army of 4,000 soldiers gathered from their allies. But the Boeotians and the Corinthians showed their disapproval of the Spartan high-handed behavior by refusing to send their quota of troops. 
Pausanias then, with just his contingent of Peloponnesian allies, marched through Arcadia to the Elian border. Immediately, they took the outposts of Lassion, and entering Elian territory, he led his army through the mountainous district of Acraria and flipped the four cities of Thraustus, Halion, Eupeion, and Opus. Then, he encamped near Pylos and took it over as well. The Spartan army was now about eight miles from Elis. From there, they advanced directly towards Elis and pitched their camp on the hills across from the Peneus River. A short time before this, the Elians had received a thousand elite troops from the Aetolians, and these men were placed on guard over the region near the Gymnasion. When Pausanias came upon this area, he led his men in a careless manner, as he did not think that the Elians would even dare to make a sortie against them. And so, he and his troops were quite shocked when the Aetolians and many of the Elian citizens poured forth from the city with weapons in their hands, which threw them into a frenzy, as about 30 were killed. Now seeing that the city would be hard to take, Pausanias decided to reverse course and began to plunder Elian territory, gathering a large amount of booty in the process. Since the winter was now at hand, he opted to build walled outposts in Elian territory, and after leaving adequate forces in them, he himself passed the winter of 402-401 BC with the rest of his army in the Achaean city of Dime, just across from the Elian border. Diodorus records that when the spring of 401 BC came, the Elians feared the Spartan army's superior strength, so they sued the Spartans for peace. On the other hand, Xenophon states that Aegis, not Pausanias, was the one sent out, and was so for two separate campaigns in 402 and 401 BC. It seems more likely that Aegis would have been in command of this army, as he was the one who had been aggrieved, and was the one who traditionally commanded the army anyways. Therefore, Xenophon's account seems more plausible. Whatever the case, in the first campaign, he likely only took troops from the southern Peloponnesus, and he marched his troops through Arcadia towards Elian territory, following the Larissus River, which formed the border between Achaea and Elis. When the army entered enemy territory and began to ravage the land, an earthquake appeared. Although it did them no harm, Aegis considered this a sign of disapproval from the gods, so he departed from Elian territory and disbanded the army. This made the Elians grow bolder, and so they sent out envoys to all of those cities that they knew were still hostile to the Spartans, and urged further opposition to Spartan foreign policy. Over the winter of 402-401 BC, the E-Force again mobilized the army against Elis, and this time, they would draw upon all of their allies to join them. Numbers aren't given, but while the Athenians dutifully sent some forces, the Boeotians and the Corinthians did not, and at the outset, neither did the Arcadians and Achaeans. Perhaps because of this defiance, with his army assembled, Aegis went a different route and attacked through Messenia, marching along the Pamissus River to the sea, where he swung northward along the coastal road until he crossed the Nada River and the rich coastal plain of southern Elis. This second, larger invasion led to many defections from the territories under Elian control, and he refrained from devastating the lands of their new friends for obvious reasons. When he reached the city of Alon, the three villages of Leprion, Machistos, and Epitalion, just across the border, were the first to flip to the Spartan side. Then, when Aegis was about to cross the Alphaeus River, the villages of Latrinoi, Amphidoloia, and Margana also came over to him. From there, Aegis went to Olympia and sacrificed to Zeus. This time, nobody tried to prevent him. With the rites completed, he took the coastal route from Olympia to the city of Elis. When the Arcadians and Achaeans heard of this, they willfully joined him in order to receive a share of the booty. And so, together, they systematically devastated and burned Elian land, capturing many cattle and prisoners in the countryside along the way. In effect, this became a campaign to reestablish Spartan authority throughout the entire Peloponnesus. It wasn't until Aegis' army came to Elis that he met his first resistance, albeit a feeble one, as a minor skirmish was easily swept away. Then they began to devastate Elis' beautiful suburbs and Gymnasia, 
but did not attempt to take the city itself, even though it was unwalled. Instead, Aegis moved his army towards the vicinity of the Elian harbor of Kailani. Meanwhile, Aegis's invasion had achieved the added effect of sparking a civil war in Elis, as a wealthy Elian man named Xeneas and his followers wished to help Aegis take the city. It seems that these men, despite their city's long history of peace and prosperity under their democratic constitution, had wanted oligarchy at home and closer ties with Sparta abroad. Unsurprisingly, Xeneas was a guest friend of Aegis and the Proxenos of the Spartans. So with Aegis nearby, Xeneas and his followers rushed from their houses with swords in their hands and began slaughtering many of their fellow citizens. Those who managed to survive the initial wave flocked to the house of a man called Thrasydeus, who Xenophon calls the popular leader at the time. From there, they regrouped, and he led them into battle. They were victorious, and those who committed the earlier slaughters fled the city to join the Spartans. Although Aegis no doubt knew of the political tensions within Elis, Xeneas' incompetent attempt to kill Thrasydeus likely shows that the two hadn't cooperated on a plot. If he had, Aegis would have simultaneously pushed his attack into unwalled Elis to support Xeneas' coup. Nonetheless, the internal discord was spontaneous, and there was no longer a unified front in Elis against the Spartans. Aegis in turn departed and crossed back over the Alpheus River. He left a garrison behind with Lysippus as Harmost, along with Xeneas and the rest of the exiles from Elis. They were stationed at Epitalion on the southern bank of the river, where it reaches the Ionian Sea, and thus commanded a secure position. Then Aegis disbanded the rest of the army, and they all returned home. For the winter of 401 400 BC, the land of the Elians was plundered with impunity by Lysippus and the soldiers under his charge at Epitalion. Finally, the following spring, in 400 BC, Thrasydeus sent an embassy to Sparta, and they came to an agreement on peace and an alliance. The imposed terms were harsh, and essentially disarmed Elis as a threat. They included the surrender of their triremes, which reduced their capacity to pose a threat to Messenia, the removal of the fortifications in their harbors of Phia and Kylene, to which Sparta wanted unimpeded access, the independence of their neighboring cities, and the establishment of a Harmos and a garrison, which was probably the only such one in the Peloponnesus. Their sweeping capitulation meant that now the Elians were confined to their own city in the Peneus Valley, and were no longer a major power. The Spartans, though, did not deprive the Elians of their supervision of the Sanctuary of Olympia, but they were not able to ever again prevent Aegis, or anyone else, from the right to offer sacrifices and to compete in the games. While it was not stipulated, the peace terms may also have demanded the installation of an oligarchic government in Elis, one which likely would have been led by Xeneas and his followers, and which thus would provide a dependable and sympathetic neighboring government for the Spartans. In any case, the significance of the Elian War was manifold. First, it reestablished Sparta's predominant position within the Peloponnesus. The elimination of Elis as a major threat left a political void that only Sparta could fill. No one south of Arcadia and Argos was able to fight Sparta's dictates or contest its exploitation of fertile land. In fact, the Elian campaign showed Arcadia the benefits of cooperation with Sparta. Except for Corinth and the ever-refractory Argos, the other Peloponnesians again followed Sparta's lead, and from the plundering of Elis, many had gained substantially. The war also revealed a ruthless Spartan use of force within the Peloponnesus, which quelled the growing unrest among the Arcadians and others for the moment. The Peloponnesians may not have enjoyed Spartan hegemony, but they accepted it, albeit with quiet resentment. Diodorus also records that now that the Spartans had brought their wars to an end in the Peloponnesus, they advanced their army against the Messenians on the outposts of Cephalonia, Zanchinthos, and now Pactus. These three all sat on strategic sea lanes between the western Gulf of Corinth and the Ionian Sea. The Spartans likely chose this moment to reduce them because they finally had the opportunity to do so. 
Now that they had the Aelian fleet, they could readily use it against these maritime targets. Then, after driving the Messenians out of these regions, they returned the outposts of Cephalonia and Xanthos to their original inhabitants, and now Pactus to the Locrians. Now that they had been driven from every place possible in the Peloponnesus and the Ionian Sea because of Sparta's ancient hatred for them, the Messenians departed with their arms from Greece, and some of them sailed to Sicily to take service as mercenaries with Dionysus of Syracuse, while about 300 others sailed to Cyrene and joined the forces of exiles there. At that time, disorder had broken out among the Cyrenians, since a certain man named Ariston and his followers had seized the city. He put to death 500 of the most influential Cyrenian citizens, and the most respected among the survivors had been banished. The exiles now added the Messenians to their number, and together they fought back against those who had seized the city. In the ensuing battle, many Cyrenians were slain on both sides, but the Messenians were killed almost to a man. After the battle, the Cyrenians negotiated with each other and agreed to be reconciled, and they immediately swore oaths not to remember past injuries and to live together as one body in the city. Apart from consolidating their hold on the Peloponnesus and central Greece, the Spartans were also determined to become the dominant power in northern Greece. There is evidence that Sparta, behind the scenes, was playing a major role in the politics of Thessaly, which at this time was a loose federation with three major centers of power at Larissa, Pharsalus, and Therai. In the speech about the constitution by Herodes, the citizens of Larissa were urged to join the Spartans in fighting King Archelaus of Macedon, who had seized the borderland between the two states. In addition, it is known from Diodorus' account that a Spartan garrison had been installed at Pharsalus, and Xenophon reports that Lycophron of Pherae was a Spartan ally. In fact, in 404 BC, Lycophron wished to rule all of Thessaly, so he conquered those Thessalians who were opposed to him, including the Larissians, defeating them in battle and killing many of them. And so the Spartans were very influential and active in the three major political centers of Thessaly, and were an ally and supporters of the man who wished to single-handedly control the entire area. Four years later, around 400 BC, civil discord arose at Heraclea and Trachis. If you recall from episode 94, during the Arcadamian War, the Spartans founded the colony at the Trachinian Cliffs, which stood immediately west of Thermopylae. But the colony eventually separated itself from Spartan control. And so the Spartans fortuitously responded to this unexpected opportunity, and a Spartiate named Heripidus was sent out as a harmost in order to restore order and to reestablish a Spartan rule of their former colony, which he did with draconian efficiency. As soon as Heripidus arrived in Heraclea, he called an assembly of the people, and surrounding them with his hoplites, he arrested those responsible for the civil discord and put them all to death, some 500 in number. And since the inhabitants of neighboring Oite had revolted, he made war on them, subjected them to many hardships, and forced them to leave their land. Most of them, together with their children and wives, fled to Thessaly, where they were restored to their homes five years later by the Boeotians. As we've discussed before, Heraclea and Trachis was strategically very important for the Spartans, as it commanded the road into southern Thessaly, close to Thermopylae, and was an excellent base for operations against Boeotia. Together with Oite, the Spartans asserted their strength here by securing the route into the Cephissus Valley through Doris and Phocis into western Boeotia. Therefore, it is hardly surprising that the Boeotians feared this encirclement of their territory and saw in it the Spartan desire to curb Boeotia's growing influence as an important Greek power in the aftermath of the Peloponnesian War. A little further north, the Macedonian king Archelaus guided his people from 413 to his death in 399 BC. We've already seen how he maintained close ties with the Athenians throughout his reign, and generously supplied them with timber to build new ships in the wake of the Syracusan disaster. In recognition of this, the Athenians had honored him as their proxenos. In terms of administration, he was an able and enlightened ruler known for many sweeping internal reforms. He issued an abundance of good quality coinage, built strongholds, cut straight roads, important for the movement of the military, and improved the military's organization, particularly the cavalry and hoplite infantry. 
As a result, he succeeded in converting Macedon into a significantly stronger power, and Thucydides even credit him with doing more for his kingdom's military infrastructure than all of his predecessors combined. He was especially known as a man of culture, and was active in opening Macedon to Hellenic influences, largely thanks to his close ties to Athens. Under Archelaus, amenities of the polis life began to take root in lower Macedon. He moved the capital and burial place of the royal family from Agai to Pella, closer to the Aegean Sea, and brought the famous painter Zeuxis there to decorate his new palace with frescoes. He established games at Dion, at the foot of Mount Olympus, in Pieria, a region sacred to Olympian Zeus and the Muses. These games included athletic, musical, and dramatic contests to demonstrate to the Greeks the Hellenization of the Macedonian kingdom. He also invited the dithyrambic poet Timotheus of Miletus, and the Athenian tragedic poets Agathon and Euripides. The latter lived in Macedon until the end of his life and was honored as a heteros, or follower, of the king. Euripides even produced his last play, the Bacchae, as a dedication to the Macedonian royal family, as well as the Archelaus, which depicted the current king as the son of Temenos, the grandson of Heracles, and the founder of the Macedonian kingdom, rather than the usual Perdiccas I. Finally, Archelaus himself competed and won in the chariot race at both the Olympic and Pythian Games. As we mentioned, in response to an appeal from the oligarchs in Larissa in 400 BC, Archelaus took possession of that Thessalian city, a move that directly impeded Sparta's desire to establish hegemony throughout Greece. But a possible Spartan-Macedonian military conflict was prevented in 399 BC. While Archelaus was hunting, he was struck by his young lover, Crateros, and died. Depending on the source you read, it may have been accidental, according to Diodorus, or intentional homicide, as reported by Aelianus. In either case, after his death, the Macedonians withdrew from Larissa due to a turbulent dynastic struggle that would engulf the Argiad royal family for the next six years, during which on the throne sat Archelaus's young lover, Crateros, for four days in 399 BC, and his minority son, Orestes, from 399 to 396 BC, under the guardianship of his brother, Aeropus, who then murdered his nephew and ruled solely from 396 to 395 BC. Upon Aeropus's death from an illness, he was succeeded by his nephew and Archelaus' youngest son, Archelaus II, from 395 to 394 BC, until he too died in a hunting accident, and then by his own son, Pausanias, who was assassinated that same year by Amyntas III, a distant royal relative, as he was the great-grandson of Alexander I. Amyntas would spend 394 to 392 consolidating his power. Meanwhile, if you remember from episode 96, Syros and his father-in-law, Arhabaeus, the king of the Lincestii, fought on the side of the Athenians against Perdiccas and the Macedonians in the northern spin-off of the Peloponnesian War. At the end of the 5th century BC, Syros was once again at war with Macedon over a claim on Lincestis. Around the end of the reign of Archelaus, so 400 to 399 BC, a new war developed between the two kings over this region. As in earlier times, Arhabaeus and Syros acted together. The results of this war are unknown, but later events show that no change happened to the status quo, and Admintus, after he came to the throne and consolidated his power, honored the agreement of his predecessor. Apparently, an Illyrian man named Bardilus opposed the agreement between Amyntas and Syros and invaded Macedon in 393 BC. Bardilus, who ruled from 393 to 358 BC, was the founder of the first attested Illyrian dynasty. Despite his humble birth as a charcoal burner and coal miner, he gained power by force and enjoyed the sympathy of the Illyrian people because he divided the spoils of war fairly and impartially. After taking power, he united many southern Illyrian tribes under his realm, and by using new warfare tactics never before used by any of the Illyrians, he expanded his dominion over Upper Macedon and Lincestis. He even won a decisive battle against Dimintus, expelled him, and essentially ruled Macedon through a puppet king named Argaeus II, who may have been a member of the royal family or some Lincestian who took the regnal name upon his ascension. 
In any case, in 392 BC, Amyntas allied himself with the Thessalians, expelled Argaeus from the throne, and brought Macedon back under his rule from the Illyrians. However, the Illyrians had become a formidable power in the Balkans, and were a constant threat to raid the northern frontiers of Macedon and Epirus, Macedon's neighbors to the southwest. Syra's daughter, Eurydice, married Amyntas around 390 BC, probably as part of an alliance against the Illyrians. They would go on to have four children, three sons, all of whom were future Macedonian kings, Alexander II, Perdiccas III, and Philip II, and a daughter named Eurino. But before we get there, we have a lot of Greek history to cover, so we will come back to Macedon in the future. Returning to the Peloponnesus, according to Xenophon, now that their wars had ended, for now at least, Aegis went to Delphi to give a tenth of the spoil to the god Apollo, which was a traditional dedication following victories. But on his way home, he fell sick in Arcadia, at a town called Haria, and died a few days after he returned to Sparta. Although his age isn't recorded at his death, he was a very old man by this point. He had ruled Sparta for 27 years, and led the army for most of the Peloponnesian War. Likely because of this fact, is why Xenophon records that his funeral and burial at Sparta were done with unparalleled majesty and pomp than what was usually accustomed to even a king. After the stipulated days of purification had passed, the Spartans had to coronate a new king. Aegis had left behind a son named Leotychidus, but there was some suspicion concerning his legitimacy, referring to Alcibiades' alleged affair with his wife that forced him out of Sparta, as we discussed in episode 102. However, others claim that, judging from the sources, Leotychides was a man at the time of Aegis' death, and Alcibiades, as his father, was a later replacement for a now unknown lover. Whatever the case, Aegis did not recognize him as his official heir to the Eurypontid throne. But Plutarch records that on his deathbed, the supplications and tears of Leotychides prevailed upon him, and so Aegis declared, before many witnesses, that Leotychides was actually his own son. Since Aegis did not leave behind any other sons, the person next in line for the throne, had he not made this declaration, was his younger half-brother, Agesilaus II, who would have been in his early 40s at this time. We know quite a bit about Agesilaus because he was greatly admired and respected by his friend Xenophon, who considered him an unsurpassed example of all civil and military virtues. Therefore, he wrote a minor biographical work about him, titled Agesilaus. We also have Plutarch's life of Agesilaus. Therefore, we have quite a bit of information on this particular Spartan. Since he was small in stature and lame from birth, in that one of his legs was longer than the other, he probably would not have been allowed to live had he not been the son of Archidamus II. Since he was not expected to succeed to the throne, he had been trained in the traditional educational curriculum of Sparta, the Agoge, and he grew up to be a twice as aggressive and ambitious than an ordinary Spartan in order to make up for his handicap. This type of mentality likely caused him to gravitate towards the younger Lysander. The two had been tentmates and maintained an intimate, likely pederastic relationship. It's hard to believe that Lysander could ever have achieved the eminence that he did and the command that was given to him had he not been a close friend of the young royal. It seems that, by this point, Lysander had abandoned his revolutionary ideas, if they were even real, and on the death of Aegis, he instead hoped to find in him a willing tool whom he could direct and control for the furtherance of his political designs. Therefore, he persuaded Agesilaus to lay claim to the throne on the ground that, despite what Aegis said on his deathbed, his son was illegitimate, and therefore, it was he who was next in line. Since he had been reared with them under the common restraints of the Agoge, many of the other Spartiates backed Agesilaus here. However, his claim was hindered by an oracle who stated, quote, Sparta, although you are very proud, lest from you, sound of foot, there springs a lamed royalty, for long unexpected toils will oppress you, and onward rolling billows of man-destroying war. End quote. 
Diopethes, a man held in high regard for his interpretation of oracles, supported Leotychitis and claimed that since Agesilaus had one foot longer than the other, the oracle was referring to him as the maimed royalty that would bring oppression to Sparta. But Lysander declared that Diopethes did not interpret the prophecy correctly, arguing that the lamed royalty did not mean that the god would be displeased if one who was lame should rule the Spartans, but that Sparta would be lamed if bastards outside the line of Heracles should be king. Because of such arguments and his great influence, Lysander prevailed here, and Agesilaus was chosen as king in late 400 BC. Such is the story of these events in the sources, but it may not necessarily be true. The details bear the stamp of rumor and propaganda. Either way, Lysander probably believed that he could control Agesilaus more easily than Leotychitis. But if that were the case, he would be mistaken, and Diopithes' prediction about the danger of a lame king, though possibly written about with historical hindsight in mind, would be confirmed with future events. Whatever the truth, Agesilaus, who assumed the throne at the height of Spartan power, proved to be one of the most pernicious and incompetent kings in Spartan history. Lysander and Agesilaus saw in one another a conduit for each to achieve their own goals. One of Agesilaus' first acts as king was to officially declare Leotychitis as a bastard and to confiscate his estates. Because Agesilaus' kinsmen on his mother's side were excessively poor, Plutarch records that he distributed half of these estates to them. By buying their loyalty, he created for himself an independent political following that bound its existence and its primary alliance to the success of his career. Agesilaus also tried a different approach to the ephors and the Gerasia, the two Spartan governmental bodies that had the greatest power in the state and that were traditionally at feud and variance with the kings. But instead of colliding and fighting with them, he courted their favor and sought to win their support before setting out on any undertaking. Furthermore, whenever he was invited to meet with them, Plutarch says that he did so immediately. If they ever visited him when he was seated on his throne, he rose in their honor. And as men from time to time made members of the Gerasia, he would send each a cloak and an oxen as a mark of honor. Consequently, even though he was honoring and exalting the dignity of their offices, he increased his own influence, power, and goodwill. Therefore, for the first time, a Spartan king created a non-traditional basis of power, one that was only marginally dependent upon the government, while also having the backing and full support of the state. Taking matters even further, Agesilaus would embark upon a foreign policy never seen before in Spartan history one that would actually see a Spartan army invade Persian territory. But before we get there, Agesilaus first had to deal with some problems at home, and Xenophon reports how, before the end of his first year on the throne, he would confront an incident proving that the political and social fabric of Sparta was becoming frayed. During the Peloponnesian War, the Spartans had frequently tapped into their huge human reservoir of helots, perioikoi, and others of inferior socio-political status in their effort to defeat Athens. Men from these groups were all promised an enhanced political and social position for their service, but that promise was not always honored after the fact, and some were callously discarded, sometimes under very suspicious circumstances. Perhaps even more importantly, many full Spartiate citizens were losing their lands, and therefore their political status. Despite the supposed equality among Sparta citizens, who were known as the homoioi, or equals, this was likely just a myth, because from the outset, some Spartans held more land, and therefore more wealth, than others, and strove increasingly to gain even more. As the land became concentrated in fewer hands even before the Peloponnesian War, the number of full citizens accordingly declined. Especially pertinent in this connection was the increasing accumulation of land by women, another major factor in the decline in the number of male citizens. The effects of that long conflict added to these developments, which gave a relatively small group of officers unprecedented opportunities to enrich themselves. Operations overseas especially gave commanders ready access to the spoils of war. Most notably, Harmost used their position to extort money from the governed. Two notable examples are Thorax, 
who made a fortune from his position as Harmost, and Gallippus, who embezzled public money. Both were discovered and punished, but the full number of others who got away with doing it is unknown. However many, they all could translate this booty into Spartan land, thereby increasing their political and social status at home. Although it's not for certain, most scholars like to place in this post-Peloponnesian war period the introduction of a new inheritance law, called the Law of Epitadius, after the ephor who proposed it. Plutarch's Life of Aegis, the 3rd century BC Aegis IV, and not the recently deceased 5th century BC Aegis II, claims that originally Spartans had not been able to depose of their kleros, or their allotment of land, and this was first allowed by Epitadius. It is also reported by Aristotle in his Politics that in the 4th century BC, a small number of families, and often women where there were no male heirs, gained possession of an increasing proportion of the kleroi. It used to be that inheritance automatically went in a certain direction, and nobody had any choice in the matter but now they could write out a will and select their inheritors however they wished. That meant that they could now buy off political supporters, who then would receive land upon their death. And so people who had been raised as Spartans and expected to inherit their father's property sometimes found that they had been cut out, and now were Spartiates by birth, but lacked the necessary wealth and land to provide for their meals at the common mess. Therefore, they could no longer be Spartiates in the full sense. These people would fall into the category of hypomyones, which means inferiors. A combination of the accumulation of land by traditionally wealthy families, the influx of foreign money, and a decrease in total Spartan citizens resulted in a greater concentration of land among the rich at the expense of the poor. And since the amount of land one owned dictated their political and social status, there now was a variety of Laconians who played a significant role in Sparta's rise to power, but didn't have the position of honor and belonging that would be expected. Inferiors and emancipated helots alike considered themselves misused by an increasingly unfair system of government. Discontent naturally simmered. All it would take was one charismatic leader to band them all together in order to bring about a revolution. In late 399 BC, In the course of conducting one of the customary sacrifices on behalf of the city, Agesilaus was told by the seer who oversaw these official sacrifices that the gods were revealing a most frightening undertaking. When he sacrificed a second time, the seer said that these sacrifices warned even more strongly than the first. When he sacrificed a third time, the seer replied, quote, Agesilaus, the god is giving us the same sign that he would if he were in the midst of the enemy. End quote. After this, they sacrificed both to the apotropaic gods who avert evil and to the savior gods who protect and save. And at that point, they received good omens and stopped sacrificing. Within five days, there was a planned revolution in the city by a man named Kinodon, who was one of these hypomyones. He was a military officer who carried out important missions for the Ephors. He was well educated, and because of his job, he should have been a valued and respected Spartan. But his family had fallen into poverty, and because he no longer could pay the dues to his Sicitia, he lost his citizenship. The details are a bit murky, though. It's not certain if Kinodon wanted to eliminate the class of equals, or just wanted to seize some of their lands for the landless so they could become full citizens themselves. In any case, he began to recruit many who aimed to set up a new regime that would give room to those who were outsiders in Laconia, and not part of the Spartan elite. However, one of the people that Kinodon had approached informed the ephors of the plot. He told them that when Kinodon had tried to recruit him, he brought him into the Agora and ordered him to count the Spartans in the crowd. Of the 4,000, only about 40 were homoioi which was a tremendous disparity in numbers between the Spartiates and their domestic enemies. The informant then told the Ephors that there were people involved in the plot from every lower section of society, including the Helots, the newly freed citizens, meaning the Neodomides, the lower grade citizens, meaning the Hypomyones, and those from the surrounding towns, meaning the Perioikoi. Whenever these men conversed about the Spartiates, It was once said that they hated the Spartans so much that they would even eat them raw. 
Those who had already served with the Spartans in battle were already in possession of weapons, and for those who hadn't yet, Kinnadon had shown the informer a warehouse intended for iron agricultural equipment, but where instead they had stored daggers, swords, iron spits, axes, axe heads, and scythes, all of which could be used as weapons for men who were farmers, carpenters, stonemasons, and so forth. Those of other crafts could use their own homemade weapons, which would be sufficient against unarmed, unsuspecting Spartans. The informer finally told the E-Force that he didn't know when the plot was to take place, just that it would be soon, as Kinnadon had told him not to leave the city. When the E-Force heard all of this, they determined that the man had described a very deliberate and credible plot, and so they were greatly troubled. They gathered together as many members of the Garrisia as they could at that exact moment, and they resolved immediately to send out Kinnadon on a mission that would bring about his downfall. They ordered him to go off to the Mycenaean village of Alon with some of the younger men in order to bring back certain Alonians and those helots whose names all were written on Escitale, a rudimentary Spartan device for encoding messages that we first described in episode 107. They also ordered him to bring back a woman who was reputed to be the most beautiful there and who had continually corrupted the Spartans, both young and old, visiting the village. Kinnadon had previously done tasks like this for the E-Force, so it didn't seem weird to him. When he asked which of the young men he should take with him, they directed him to the oldest of the Hippogretai, the three officers who choose the Hippace, or the elite body of 300 troops that accompanied the king. This man was to send him with an adequate number from among those present. The E-4s, of course, had taken care that the commander knew what was happening and which men to send with him. Kinnadon ultimately was to be arrested by these men, but the E-4s did not wish for this to be done at Sparta, as they did not know the extent of the conspiracy and wanted to learn who his accomplices were outside of the city before anyone could get word that their plot had been upended and could run away. The E-4s considered the threat so serious that they also sent a squadron of cavalry to accompany the men on their journey to Alon. When Kinnadon and his Spartan entourage arrived at Alon, he was arrested. Likely under torture, he then identified those who were his co-conspirators. While Kinnadon was still held under arrest in Alon, the cavalry raced back to Sparta and presented the names to the E-Force. The other conspirators were arrested. Then, Kinnadon was brought back to Sparta and interrogated by the E-Force as to why and for what purpose he had formed this plot, and he replied that his aim was not to be considered an inferior any longer to anyone in Sparta. All of the conspirators' hands were then bound, and a collar was placed on their necks. As they were led around the city, they were struck by whips and goaded for humiliation as a deterrent for future revolutions. Although Xenophon does not mention it, they were surely executed afterwards. There is no way that they would have been allowed to live. Although the plot was averted, there was about a 400 to 1 ratio of non-Spartiates to Spartiates, so the possibility of revolution would remain a constant fear in the Spartan mind. The unrest was quelled for the moment, but it would simmer for decades. As we shall see, the decline in citizen numbers owing to these internal problems would combine with combat losses in impending wars to further cause a decrease in their ranks and to increase discontent within all levels of society. The spoils of the empire insidiously infected Sparta both externally and internally. Having put their affairs on the Greek mainland in order, and having settled their own, for the time being, the Spartans were now free to confront the Persians. The main issue surrounded what would happen to the Greek cities on the coast of Asia Minor, which were under Athenian control during the Peloponnesian War, but were given to the king of Persia by the Spartans in the treaties that they made with him during the war. Naturally, these cities wanted to achieve autonomy for themselves, and claimed that they regarded the rule either by Persian or by Spartan, as improper and something to be resisted. So as Lysander was busy dealing with the Athenians and with problems at home, and with Cyrus off in Susa, dealing with the succession crisis following his father's death, Tissaphernes, the satrap of Caria, took the opportunity to restore many of the Democrats who had fled to him back to their original cities and to drive out the oligarchs. In this way, the Ionian cities unofficially fell under his control again. As we discussed in episode 110, 
From 403 to 401 BC, the Spartans had become involved in Cyrus's failed revolt against his brother Artaxerxes. It is clear that the Spartans' military aid to Cyrus was motivated not only by the obligation to repay a favor as he had helped them against the Athenians, but also by the expectation of a reward. They likely expected Cyrus, once he took the throne, to gift control back to them of the Asiatic Greeks for their growing empire. If that was the case, his failed coup and death put a wrench into that, because now they had gained the bitter hatred of Artaxerxes. The Persian king in turn repaid Tissaphernes' loyalty to him by officially giving him control once again of all territories that Cyrus had previously taken away from him, including Lydia, Phrygia, Ionia, and Iolus, to go along with the satrapy and Caria. Therefore, things essentially reverted back to what they had been before Cyrus came along. Tissaphernes was in fact, and perhaps in title, the new Keranos, and all of the non-Greek cities sent ambassadors to his court to show their loyalty. But since the Ionians had sided with Cyrus during the civil war, they feared repercussions, and more importantly, they wished to be free, so they did not recognize Tissaphernes' authority. In response, Tissaphernes let it be known that he intended to subjugate the Ionian cities once again. The Spartan Harmos now had no paymaster and no idea of what response the home government would provide for the crisis. They stood isolated in the midst of considerable hostile forces. Matters worsened for them when they learned that Tamos had recently fled to Egypt with his fleet. Tamos was a mercenary Egyptian admiral hired by Cyrus, and his desertion left them without local naval support. As an aside, Tamos would die shortly after that back in Egypt. According to Diodorus, the current Egyptian pharaoh was named Samatikos, who can probably be identified with Amertius. He reports that after Tamos returned to Egypt, not wanting to be seen as harboring a traitor to the Persian king, the Egyptian pharaoh executed Tamos and his family. This seems unlikely, as the Egyptians themselves were traitors, in the Persian eyes, since they had just recently revolted from the Persian Empire, as we discussed in episode 110. In all likelihood, though, the Egyptian pharaoh probably just wanted to confiscate Tamus' fleet and possessions in order to strengthen his own naval power. Unfortunately for him, he wouldn't live long to reap its rewards, as a general named Nefertiti staged a coup, executed Amertius, and put himself on the throne two years later. In any case, as the situation stood in late 401 BC, the Greeks of Asia Minor responded immediately to Tissaphernes' threats by sending ambassadors to Sparta and asking for help since the Persians were now the immediate menace. They begged the Spartans not to allow their cities to be laid to waste by the barbarians, but to protect them since they were now the leaders over all of Greece. This appeal gave the Spartans a legitimate, in their opinion, excuse to intervene in Asia Minor. As a result, they promised to come to their aid and sent ambassadors to Sisyphernes with an official warning for him not to bear arms against the Greek cities. This message portrayed them as defenders of the Asiatic Greeks once again, but instead of the Athenians, it was now the Persians who needed to be defended against. This role would allow them to legitimately, again in their opinion, install Harmosts and bring the cities more firmly back under their control. Tissaphernes, though, ignored their warning. It seems likely that he intended to occupy the cities of Ionia on the grounds that the Spartans had broken the so-called Treaty of Boethius by aiding the revolt of Cyrus, and therefore the autonomy of these Asiatic Greeks was lawfully forfeited in his eyes. To him, the Spartans had hypocritically violated their own oaths when swearing to their treaty obligations. They had, in effect, betrayed the Persians and the gods whom they had invoked. Caught in their contradictions and duplicity, they were now stuck between the ideal of Greek autonomy and their sworn treaty to the Persians. The Spartans preferred the ideal, but were now confronted with the reality of enforcing it. Tissaphernes answered by taking his army and plundering the territory of the Chimeans at the mouth of the Xanthos River. There, he took many prisoners. Afterwards, he laid siege to the city of Chaim, but since he could not capture it by the onset of winter, he released the captives for a heavy ransom, removed the siege, 
and returned to his court at Sardis in Lydia. Despite his inability to take the city, Tissaphernes had demonstrated his determination to regain control of the Greek cities under his charge. In response, that winter, the Spartans openly declared war on Persia. The Spartans, though, embarked upon this venture with no preconceived plan for liberating Asia Minor. They formed neither a coherent strategy nor any effective means to implement one. They determined no priority of targets to attack nor specific objectives to secure. Nor did they make any plans for concentrating their resources to defeat Tissaphernes. As a result, they only ineffectually attempted to deal the Persians a lethal blow. The problem was admittedly complicated. With his extensive powers, which included his newfound authority over Pharnabasis, Tissaphernes governed the satrapies of Aeolus and Ionia, the boundary between them being the Hermos River and the satrapy of Caria which was separated from Ionia by the Myandros River. Even though the challenge was daunting, the Spartans had long enjoyed using the fine harbor and city of Ephesus as their principal base on the Asian littoral. Their holdings to the north included, at least nominally, all of the major ports, notably Smyrna, Phokia, Chaim, and Ibidos. This wide expanse of coastline offered them several points from which they could hold the coast and push inland. They could either wear down the Persians by attrition, or confront them in a decisive battle. If they succeeded in neither, it would in turn put them at risk of a Persian counterattack. Tissaphernes enjoyed the geographical advantage, and several routes were at his disposal. The western coast of Asia Minor is separated from the interior by a chain of mountains penetrated by several rivers. Communications among the Greek cities along the coast were tentative and difficult, except by sea. Attack from inland, though, was quite easy, as the main river valleys allowed the Persians to respond when and where they chose. In addition, a very good Persian road system greatly facilitated the movement of troops and supplies. The main artery was the great royal road that ran from Persepolis, past Susa and Sardis, to Ephesus. Two others led from Smyrna in the north and westwards from Apamea. The coast was easier to counterattack than defend. Tissaphernes could use any and all of these routes to strike along the coast and defeat the Spartans piecemeal. The Spartans, likewise, lacked the material resources and men to commit themselves to extensive campaigning in Asia Minor, which would be needed to defeat the Persians. They lacked a war chest to finance sustained operations, both in terms of supplying their own troops and paying for the mercenaries needed to bolster their efforts. Unless they could successfully live off the land in Asia Minor and exact greater amounts of money from the Eastern Greeks, the Spartans could not effectively operate there for long periods. The problem was especially severe regarding the mercenaries, who were notoriously unreliable, especially when their pay was late. The strength of the Spartan citizen army remains a further difficult problem. By 400 BC, the Spartans could muster at least 6,700 infantry and cavalry. This force, augmented by allied levies, could swell the ranks to 13,400. It was sufficient to defend Sparta and to maintain order in the Peloponnesus, but was too valuable to send far abroad on hazardous ventures. The expectation of further reinforcements from Asia Minor was dubious and unpredictable too. In effect, the Spartans could campaign only with a small number of citizens and allies, supplemented by some mercenaries and local Eastern Greek levies, the entirety of which constituted neither coherent nor reliable host. An additional problem was the Spartan failure to appreciate the importance of cavalry in the intendant field of operations. The Spartans had long considered cavalry an inferior arm, but in the open plains of the Anatolian river valleys, a lack of it prevented mobility and ease of operations. Even where a suitable army assembled, although some had held local commands, none had directed a grand campaign. In that respect, they lacked the experience and vision of Lysander. To worsen matters, the Spartans frequently changed generals and sometimes sent advisors to accompany them. And so no one general, if indeed capable of envisioning a broad policy, was in a good position to carry it to completion. Each successive commander learned of the specific challenges confronting him only upon his arrival on the scene, without apparently having received much useful direction from the home government or his predecessors. 
Next in urgency was the weakness of Spartan sea power. Tamos' fleet by now was in Egyptian hands, and Spartan finances were already problematic and strained. The Spartans needed a substantial fleet to cover any military adventures inland, to maintain control of the Aegean, and to repulse the Persian navy. They themselves lacked the material resources to create a fleet large enough and would need substantial external funding, which was not obviously available. Once again, arose the question of leadership. Only Lysander had demonstrated any ability in naval command, so it remained dubious whether the Spartans could provide officers able enough to train crews successfully and lead them to victory on sea, especially in the face of the veterans of the Persian fleet. In sum, the Spartans lacked the unity of command, experienced officers of sufficient rank, the men, the strategy, the money, and the equipment that would be necessary to adequately defeat the Persians. Moreover, they had no idea how to win this war, which they lost even before they had committed their forces to it. To appreciate the significance of these simple facts, one needs only to consider the advantages enjoyed by the Persians. They possessed ample manpower that could readily be augmented and had immediate superiority in cavalry. Their chain of command was clear, understood, and respected. Their supplies were identifiable and abundant, and more could be drawn from the vaster resources of the empire. Persian defenses were as deep as they were wide. While Spartan victory depended upon driving the Persians far inland, their enemy needed only to drive the invader into the sea. In that respect, the situation of the Spartans repeated the difficulties that the Greeks had encountered during the Ionian Revolt. Furthermore, Tissaphernes and Pharnabases weighed heavily on the scales. Both were consummate diplomats with credible loyalty to the king, though they naturally looked also to their own good fortunes. In that respect, fighting for the king meant fighting for themselves. Tissaphernes, though not an otherwise brilliant general, nonetheless used his cavalry with great skill. Pharnabases was a superb naval strategist. In this gathering storm, Persian leadership, resources, and command of the theater of war all proved superior to those of the Spartans. These problems, then, make one question whether the Spartans were even committed to this war at all. They were just too short of Spartiates to be risking them in overseas ventures, especially ones where the deck was heavily stacked against them. Still, they did vote to send one as commander. They appointed Thibron, with the rank of Harmost, and with orders to prosecute the war with Tissaphernes. They gave him a force of a thousand Neodomides, or freed helots. The notion of sending Neodomides overseas to fight was very attractive to the Spartans, because it got them out of Laconia, and therefore removed them as a danger, and provided Thibron with soldiers, without having to send any Spartiates. With these men, Thibron then traveled to Corinth, where the Spartans had ordered their Peloponnesian allies to gather with additional men. In total, he managed to assemble 4,000 Peloponnesian troops and the 300 Athenian cavalrymen who had faithfully supported the 30 tyrants. Xenophon reports that the Athenians chose to send those who had served in the cavalry under the 30 tyrants as they thought it would be advantageous to the people if these men went abroad and died there so that they could not cause any more issues for the city in the future. With a total force of 5,300, Thibron sailed off to Ephesus. When they arrived in late 400 BC, Thibron also ordered the Asiatic Greek cities to send forces. Xenophon records that they obeyed any order that a Spartan might give them at the time, and so he gathered an additional 2,000 troops, making his total force number 7,300 now. Still, with a force this small, he could at best defend himself, but it was not enough to liberate the Eastern Greeks. His army was so small and weak that it would not be able to even confront Persian cavalry on level ground. Such was the profundity of Spartan planning. Unsurprisingly, Thibron made very little headway overall, but he did try to attack quickly. Diodorus reports that, from Ephesus, his army then advanced to Magnesia on the Myandros River, which was under the control of Tissaphernes. He took the city easily at the first assault and then penetrated deeper inland and began to lay siege to trails. But when he was unable to achieve any success because of its strong position, he turned back to Magnesia. All along the way, his troops freely plundered the prosperous countryside. Since the city of Magnesia was unwalled, Thibron transferred his army to a neighboring hill called Mount Thorax. 
However, Tissaphernes arrived with strong cavalry forces, so he withdrew to Ephesus. Thibron, at this time, did not bring his inferior cavalry force down into the plain to attack the Persians, but was content to keep a close watch on the enemy, and to keep their forces from ravaging the nearby land. As we mentioned, the lack of adequate cavalry, a perennial weakness of the Spartan army, denied Thibron the possibility to operate successfully in the open plains of Western Asia. So he switched focus northward to Aeolus, against Pharnabasis. In preparation, Thribaron tried to recruit additional forces in the form of mercenaries to join his army. At this time, as we discussed last episode, about 5,000 of those 10,000 mercenaries who had marched into the Persian Empire with Cyrus were in the territory of the Thracians with their general Xenophon. Rather than giving home to poverty, they opted to remain as mercenaries. Hearing Thibron's call for assistance, they crossed over from Thrace to Asia Minor and joined the Spartan campaign against the Persians. These veterans not only swelled his meager ranks, but also supplied the Spartans with much-needed expertise in mobile warfare. Therefore, their importance is incalculable. According to Xenophon, the following spring of 399 BC, Thibron willingly gained several cities in northwestern Asia Minor, including Pergamon, Tuthrania, Helisarna, Gambrion, Pale Gambrion, and Grinion in the region of Mesia and Aeolus, as well as Myrina on the island of Lemnos. In addition, he was able to capture some weaker towns by force, but the taking of one minor polis in particular proved too difficult. This polis was Larissa, which stood on an isolated hill about a kilometer north of the Hermes River, the modern Gadiz and enjoyed protection on its eastern and northern sides by steep slopes. Strong walls then reinforced these natural advantages. Thibron besieged Larissa, encircling it with an army after his attempts at persuasion had failed. When he could not take it by any other means, he attempted to cut a shaft and dig a conduit that would cut off the city's water supply. The Larissians, though, would run out from the wall and throw wooden stones into the shaft. In response, Thibron made a wooden covering over it, but they countered by attacking at night and setting the cover on fire. Since it seemed that he was having no success, the ephors ordered him to leave Aeolus and redirect his campaign instead against Tissaphernes and Caria. This was actually a good strategical call. Despite his gains, Thibron had failed to win control of the Meandros and Hermes river valleys, which in turn meant that he had done little to protect Ephesus and nothing to harm Tissaphernes. And so if Ephesus was going to remain his base for operations, he needed to shore it up. But while he was back in Ephesus planning his march to Caria, he found out that the new board of E4s felt that he was conducting the war inefficiently, so they decided to go in an entirely new direction altogether. And a man named Derkylidus arrived to relieve him of his command. Reluctantly, Thibron departed for Sparta, which turned out to be an unwise decision because when he returned home, he was fined and sent into exile, thanks to Sparta's allies having brought a charge against him that he had allowed his army to plunder the lands of those friendly to Sparta. Who knows whether this was true, though. Although Thibron appears less incompetent in Diodorus' account than in that of Xenophon, ultimately, he did not make much progress in liberating the Asiatic Greeks. Still, he had done a decent job with his limited resources and even won much-needed local support. The fault can more appropriately be laid on the failing of the E-Force for not giving him an adequate cavalry force at the bare minimum. The man who replaced Thibron, as we said, was Derkylitus, the first of a series of men with links to Lysander. He had such a reputation for cunning that his nickname was Sisyphus, after the mythical hero from Corinth who was both notoriously cunning and incapable of being deceived, something which Ephorus claimed was true of Derkylidus as well. He had previously served as Harmost of Abydos during the latter stages of the Peloponnesian War, and he had grown hostile to Pharnabasis because the satrap had brought a grave dishonor upon him when punishing him for some minor offense. Apparently, Pharnabasis made Derkylidus stand while holding his shield, 
a grave dishonor for Spartans, since it was normally inflicted on those who failed to maintain proper formation. And so, when Derkylidus took over the army, he quickly assessed the situation and realized that Tissaphernes and Pharnabasus were enemies. The sources don't mention if Thibron made that realization too. In either case, Derkylidus opted to fight one rather than both of them at the same time. So he made a truce with Tissaphernes and led his army into the territory of his bitter enemy, Pharnabasus. The ephors presumably had charged him, as they had Thibron, to carry on the war against Tissaphernes. Instead, the chief Spartan field officer, without orders from home, had made a pact with the enemy whom he had been sent to defeat. Therefore, Derkylidus, it seems, disregarded his public duty to settle a private grudge. Furthermore, this truce was very much in Tissaphernes' interest. He had temporarily rid himself of an enemy and could use the time to strengthen his forces. If Derkylidus defeated Pharnabasus, he would also be free of his local rival. If Pharnabasus won, he would not even need to fight the Spartans at all. Basically, he could let his opponents do the hard work for him and benefit from either outcome. Derkylidus also had his own reasons for coming to an understanding with Tissaphernes. Apart from his slight by Pharnabasus, Tissaphernes had already proven himself a formidable foe, and his resources were greater than that of Derkylidus, who had only some 7,000 men under his command. In addition, the Spartans could effect very few reinforcements from home, because Dionysius, the current tyrant of Syracuse, was actively recruiting mercenaries, especially from Sparta, against the Carthaginians. More on that in a future episode. Furthermore, Derkylidus could argue that even if he had not liberated the Greek cities from Tissaphernes' control, he had at least gained the promise of their peace and security. Finally, Derkylidus was also more familiar with northwestern Anatolia than with Ionia. This combination of self-preservation and prudent opportunism saw Derkylidus march north through friendly Aeolus and away from Tissaphernes' Caria. Once again, the Spartan had earned his nickname Sisyphus, of a free and independent spirit, one who preferred the pleasures of travel to life in Sparta. Derkylidus may very well have harbored a private ambition to carve out his own little domain in Aeolus and the Chersonese. His previous contacts in the area and his exalted position certainly increased the possibility of personal success that would not necessarily come at the expense of Sparta's interests. Whatever his ultimate aims, though, he surely looked to his own future as assiduously as he did that of Sparta. From the very outset, Derkylidus differed greatly in his command from Thibron in that he did not allow his army to harm his allies as it marched through friendly territory towards the Troad, the territory on the eastern side of the Hellespont that currently belonged to Pharnabasis. Thibron had apparently won the following of many Aeolian cities, but there was one particular unsettled situation in its northwestern part that he hoped to take advantage of. The problem there arose from Pharnabasis' custom of allowing local officials to act as local rulers so long as they paid him the usual tribute. At this point in the narrative, Xenophon details how one of these territories had been administered by a woman named Mania of Dardanos, who took over after her husband had died. She brought many gifts to Pharnabasis whenever she went to meet with him, and whenever he visited her land, he found her hospitality to be much finer and more enjoyable than the rest of his subordinates. According to Xenophon, she had even added the coastal cities of Larissa, Hamaxitos, and Coloni to his domain by using a Greek mercenary force to attack their walls while she herself gave orders from her horse. She also campaigned alongside Pharnabasus whenever he attacked the Mysians or Pisidians, who regularly plundered Persian territory. Because of all of this, she was held in high regard. But in 399 BC, she was murdered by her son-in-law, a man named Midias who was envious of her victories and general success and believed that it was shameful for a woman to rule. He then murdered her son, so his brother-in-law, and took possession of her private wealth. All cities in their domain refused to receive him though, and Pharnabasus himself swore to avenge her murder and refused his request for her position. This was the situation when Derkylidus arrived in the area, and the political confusion of the region made his incursion all the easier. 
Many Greek states there wanted freedom from Persian rule, while others remained hostile to the usurper Midias. But Dercyllidus needed to act fast, before the satrap could reassert his own authority. Immediately, in just one day, the coastal cities of Larissa, Hamaxitos, and Colonae all came over to him on their own accord. Dercyllidus also sent envoys to the rest of the cities of Aeolus to receive him within their walls and to become Spartan allies. Of course, this meant Spartan occupation in the form of Harmosts. The cities of Neandria, Ilion, and Cochilion accepted this invitation since they had been treated very badly after the death of Mania. He also likely won the adherence of Dardanus, whose people harbored no love of the usurper Midias. None of these were formidable places individually, but collectively they all held considerable strategic significance. In just a few days, Dracilidus had gained control of the entire Troad coast. Afterwards, the Spartan commander began to venture inland through the Scamandrus river valley, and this is where he encountered his first obstacle. The garrison commander in the well-fortified city of Kebrin decided to remain loyal to Pharnabasis, as he believed that the satrap would arrive in time to repulse any Spartan attack and then reward him handsomely for his loyalty. So when he received news of this, Thercyllidus prepared to attack the city without hesitation. Kebron stood atop a steep cliff with a wall around it. Despite this, Thercyllidus hoped to storm it before Pharnabasis could come to its defense. Unfortunately, the sacrifices were not favorable for four days, greatly annoying him. Then, a Sicyonian company commander named Athanatus thought that Thercyllidus was blustering and wasting time so he took his own unit and tried to block up the spring, which was the city's water supply. But the defenders came running out, wounding Athanatus and killing two others with their arrows before driving the rest back. Then, much to Dercyllidus' surprise, a herald from Kebrin came out and said that the action of their commander did not please them, and they instead wished to ally with the Greeks rather than the Persians. As it so happened, the sacrifices now proved favorable So Dercyllidus immediately took up his weapons and led the army to the gates. The men within opened them and permitted them to enter. Seeing this state of affairs, the garrison commander also then sent a herald offering his surrender. After the townspeople and the commander submitted, Dercyllidus established a garrison. Possession of Kebrin gave him control of the upper Scamandros River Valley and forged a link to the coastal cities that he had just previously acquired. From Kebron, Dercyllidus then marched against neighboring Skepsis and Gergis, two interior villages held by Midias. As the home of Midias and the seat of his power, Skepsis was a very important target. Like Kebron, it was well fortified atop steep cliffs, but the surrender of Kebron shook Midias' resolve. Fearful of his own citizens now, Midias sent to Dercyllidus, saying that he wished to negotiate an alliance with him. Dercyllidus responded that this would only be possible if he allowed those under his control to be free and autonomous. Bowing to pressure, Midias allowed Dercyllidus into the city, offering to surrender Skepsis to him in return for assurances of his own safety. As a result, Dercyllidus sacrificed to Athena on the Acropolis of Skepsis and led out Midias' garrison. The city was handed over to the people, and he urged them to behave in a manner consistent with free Greeks. He then departed and led his army northward towards the last remaining holdout, Gergis, with Midias tagging along as his hostage. Gergis, like Kebron and Skepsis, sat atop steep cliffs and too was well fortified. Also sat atop steep cliffs and was well fortified. But when they reached Gergis, Dercyllidus commanded Midias to order their defenders to open the gates. As a result, they entered the city peacefully and once again, sacrificed to Athena on the Acropolis. The Spartans kept the city and took Midias' troops into his own service. In return, Dercyllidus promised to treat him fairly. He took all of Mania's property away from Midias in order to use it to pay his army, but true to his word, he sent him back to his father's house unarmed. In a brilliant campaign that saw very little fighting, but a whole lot of guile and diplomacy, Dercyllidus had captured nine cities in the Troad and Aeolus in just eight days, all while collecting enough money to finance his army for an entire year. This campaign, together with the modest success of Thibron, 
gave the Spartans control in Asia Minor, from Dardanus in the north to Ephesus in the south. They also held the Scamandros, Kaikos, and probably Hermos river valleys, together with the littoral of the Myandros. The only cities in the region which resisted Spartan power were Atarnius, then held by Chian exiles, and Larissa, neither of which was likely to pose any serious problems. Moreover, Dercilidus's rapid and unexpected advance threatened Pharnabasus' power in Phrygia. With the strategical position between the Spartans and Persians having now changed, it remained to be seen how he would use his initial successes to his advantage, and how Pharnabasus would respond to it. Even still, Dercilidus knew that he had no answer for Persian cavalry, and that winter was fast approaching. So he sent a message to Pharnabasus and asked him whether he wanted peace or war. Pharnabasus chose peace and agreed to make a truce for the winter. Afterwards, Dercilidus went to Bithynian Thrace, where he wintered over 399-398 BC. Dercilidus' conduct here clearly illustrates how poorly prepared the Spartans were for sustained warfare. The home government had no concept of a coherent, comprehensive strategy for liberating the Greek cities nor had it made any plans for supplying and maintaining its expeditionary force. As a result, Dercilidus had no realistic alternative but to act as a freebooter to feed his army. In the broader scheme of things, his interlude in Bithynia contributed nothing to the liberation of the Greek cities. His troops instead spent much of the winter plundering the Bithynians and living off their captured booty, and in the fighting, the Spartans suffered heavy casualties that they could ill afford to lose. In effect, instead of pressing his momentum, Dracilidus returned the strategical advantage to Pharnabasis by eluding the territory of the Persian satrap's enemy, that being the Bithynians, while reducing his own meager strength in the process. That winter, while plundering Bithynia, some 200 cavalry and 300 peltasts were sent to Dracilidus by Suthes II, king of the Odrysians. Together, they raided the countryside and gathered much plunder and captives. But at dawn one morning, while most were off plundering, besides a guard of about 200 hoplites, the Bithynians decided to attack their camp. The Peltas killed all but 15, before departing and taking the camp's accumulated plunder and captives with them. When the rest arrived, they found nothing in the camp but naked corpses. So Xenophon says that the Odrysians buried their dead and held a horse race in their honor. This corroborates Herodotus' account which also says that the Thracians put on athletic contests as part of their burial rites. Finally, when spring of 398 BC came around, Dercilidus marched from Bithynian Thrace to Lampsacus on the northwestern coast of Asia Minor. Its position northeast of Abydos made it a good base for Spartan operations further along the coast to the east. His movement there surely indicates that he intended to move against Pharnabasis in Phrygia itself. But before Dercilidus could act, three commissioners from Sparta arrived at Lampsacus. Their names were Arachos, now Bates, and Antisthenes, and they were ordered by the ephors to examine the situation in Asia Minor and to let Dercilidus know that he would remain in command for the coming year. They also advised him that ambassadors from the Chersonesus had arrived in Sparta with complaints that the Thracians had invaded their land in great multitudes and laid waste to the whole region. The Greeks and the Chersonesus were so frightened that they wished for the Spartan army to come back over from Asia for their protection. After relaying this message, the three commissioners then departed for Ephesus. So knowing that he would be in command again, Dercilidus sent to Pharnabasus and asked him again whether he wanted war or peace. And again, Pharnabasus opted for peace, as a slightly longer eight-month truce this time was agreed upon. The satrap had once again spared his land without lifting a finger and gave himself time to develop a response. In the strictest terms, Dracilidus fulfilled his duty by obeying the orders of his superiors. His goal was not necessarily to wage war against Pharnabasus and Tissaphernes, but to liberate the Greek cities. Yet he could not free the Greeks without eliminating the Persian threat. Any other policy involved the avoidance of this obvious fact. But Dracilidus did not shape any sort of grand strategy and the Spartan government proved incapable of doing so. Time and again, the home government only responded to external stimuli, and it seemed incapable to have understood the bigger picture. In any case, having received his orders, Dracilidus crossed over the Hellespont with his army to the Chersonesus, 
drove the Thracians out of the country and shut off the peninsula by a wall, which he ran from sea to sea. It was completed by late summer, spanning four miles and enclosing and protecting eleven cities and their pasturelands. By this act, he prevented any future descent into the Chersonesus by the Thracians, and after being honored with great gifts, he transported his army back to Asia in the summer of 397 BC. He then reviewed the state of the Asiatic Greek cities, where he found that some Chian exiles had seized Aeternaeus and were using it as their base to launch plundering raids throughout Ionia. The Acropolis of Aeternaeus stood on two tall hills, separated from each other by a deep saddle that was backed by a lower hill. It posed a considerable challenge, though, as Dercilidus quickly learned because the siege of the city would take eight months. After finally taking Aeternaeus, he placed people in charge who were friendly to Sparta, and then departed with the army for Ephesus. Meanwhile, after the truce had been made with the Spartans, Pharnabasis prepared for the inevitable resumption of hostilities. According to Xenophon, he went to Artaxerxes, and together with Stesius, the Greek physician at the Persian court, they urged the great king for help in prosecuting the war against the Spartans. Artaxerxes, after all, still held enmity towards the Spartans for providing aid to Cyrus against him. So the great king ordered the two Persian satraps, who hated each other, to work together. Due to his role in the civil war, he gave Tissaphernes supreme command of the army and gave Pharnabasis 500 talents of silver to fit out a new naval force. The Persians knew that in order to defeat the Spartans and remove them entirely from Asia, he would need a fleet strong enough and a general capable enough to deprive them of their supremacy at sea. It just so happened that both of those could be fined on Cyprus. At the time, Cyprus was a Persian possession, but on that island, some cities had a degree of autonomy as vassals. One of them had as its king a man named Evagoras, who was very ambitious for himself and for the Cypriots. He at the moment was at odds with the great king over a local matter on the island, so he refused to pay tribute. But Artaxerxes was willing to overlook this since Evagoras was eager to fight against the Spartans on his behalf and had a fleet and a capable general in his possession. Although his motives are not made clear by our sources, a reasonable guess is that he may have hoped by achieving something as great as defeating the Spartans for the Persian king, he might be allowed to rule over all of Cyprus. In addition, as we discussed in episode 106, the Athenian general Conan had taken refuge at Evagoras' court after his final defeat at Agos Potami, since he felt too embarrassed to go home to Athens. He arrived with eight Athenian triremes and 16,000 men, who were encouraged to stay as guests. Therefore, a remnant of the Athenian navy had lived on in Cyprus. All this time, Conan still felt a hatred for Sparta, and he also wished to reclaim the leadership of Greece for Athens, and redeem his tarnished reputation. When Evagoras offered up such an experienced and capable naval commander, it was a no-brainer, and Pharnabasis, in the name of the great king, appointed Conan as vice commander at sea. Quickly, Conan catapulted from an obscure Athenian exile into the forefront of an ambitious campaign. After an exchange of letters and envoys between Evagoras and Conan on the one hand, and Artaxerxes and Stesius on the other, the great king ordered the Cypriots, Cilicians, and Phoenicians to begin building a fleet with each to contribute 100 triremes for a total of 300. This task was to be overseen by Evagoras, and he was ordered to have 100 of them ready for active service by the following year. Conan and Pharnabasis were now working together to defeat the Spartans at sea. As commander-in-chief, Pharnabasis controlled the purse strings, but Conan, as the vice-admiral, would lead the fleet. An Athenian, in command of a Persian fleet, manned primarily by Greeks, would at least give a semblance of it being a friendly force, not a barbarian one. For the moment, Conan led 40 ships that had already been fitted out to Cilicia for further preparations. Pharnabasis also sailed with him across to Cilicia and then to Caria, where he and Tissaphernes began to make preparations for the war. Despite Dercilidus' initial successes, the Ionians were dissatisfied, as they fully realized that nothing had actually been settled. By this point, the Ionian cities wanted their autonomy from Tissaphernes, which had been achieved by Spartan armed intervention, to be established formally and legally. Therefore, they sent envoys to Sparta, imploring them to deal decisively with Tissaphernes. They suggested a campaign against Caria, just as the Spartans had earlier entrusted to Thibron. One envoy said, quote, 
if Caria, where Tissaphernes had his home, were to suffer badly, he would very quickly allow themselves, the Ionian cities, to be autonomous, end quote. This appeal reminded the ephors that neither Thibron nor, De- nor Derkylidus had accomplished their assigned tasks. Though far off, Artaxerxes responded to this diplomatic effort by sending Stesius in the summer of 397 BC as his ambassador to Sparta. Stesius' message repeated the Persian stipulations that the Spartans must evacuate Asia and recognize his right to the Greek cities there. There was nothing new here except for another reminder that the Spartans had steadfastly refused to honor their treaty obligations to him. The king's position was both an ultimatum and a sign that the Spartan campaigns had failed to move him. As a result, hearing the pleas of the Eastern Greek envoys, the Spartan ephors sent orders to Derkylidus at Ephesus to cross the Myandros River into Caria with his army while his navarch, Pharax, would sail along and support their western flank with the ships. They gave these orders in complete ignorance that Conan and the Cypriots were preparing a surprise for them. At the same time, Pharnabasis and Tissaphernes gathered soldiers from their own satrapies, and they marched out, making their way towards Ephesus, where the Spartans currently had their forces stationed. The army accompanying them numbered 20,000 infantrymen and 10,000 cavalrymen, with Tissaphernes on the right wing and Pharnabasis on the left. On hearing of the approach of the Persians, Derkylidus ordered his army into battle formation, having around 7,000 men in total. They were eight ranks deep, with Peltast and cavalry stationed on the wings. As the forces drew near each other on the Myandros Plain, those troops from Priene, Achaeleon, the islands, and the Ionian cities either abandoned their arms and retreated, or remained at their positions, but clearly showed that they did not intend to stand and fight. At the same time, it had been reported by Derkylidus that Pharnabasis, fully wanting to employ his numerical superiority, especially with his cavalry, wished to fight. But Tissaphernes was a bit gun-shy, as he remembered how the Greek forces with Cyrus's army had fought and defeated the Persians at Cunaxa. Therefore, he sent a message to Derkylidus, offering a peace parley. The Spartan general accepted. The two met the next day at a predetermined place, and another truce was agreed upon. The terms were that the Persians would grant autonomy to the Greek cities, and that Derkylidus' army, as well as the Spartan Harmosts, would leave Persian territory. In the meantime, the Persians retired to Trelace and the Greeks to Leucophris at Magnesia on the Meandros River. While these terms were to be reported back to Sparta and the great king for their approval, but events would happen that would prevent that. Regardless, this was a spineless blunder by Tissaphernes, as the flat land of the Meandros greatly favored his much superior Persian cavalry. Instead of crushing the invaders under such opportune conditions, his cowardice would be costly and no doubt it would cause Artaxerxes to question his capability as commander-in-chief. At the very least, he did manage to gain additional time for Pharnabasis' fleet under Conan to enter the fray. Meanwhile, according to Xenophon, a man named Herodas from Syracuse happened to be in Phoenicia on some unspecified business. There, he observed a number of Phoenician ships being fitted out. When he heard that 300 triremes were being prepared, he went aboard the first ship for Greece and reported it to the Spartans that the great king and Tissaphernes were fitting out the aforementioned large naval force. Although he couldn't report on their intention or destination, the Spartans were alarmed and expected the worst. They also likely were unaware that Conan had sailed 40 ships already to Cilicia and was acting as admiral of the Persian fleet. As a result, they called together an emergency meeting of their allies in order to confer on what should be done. If they hadn't already, they presumably voted to reject the peace offer between Derkylidus and Tissaphernes, likely because they didn't trust the Persian satrap to keep his promises. This also allowed Lysander to bring his experience to bear on the crisis. Despite the reputed numbers of the Persian fleet, he believed that the Greeks would still perform far superior at sea. The logic here is difficult to understand, though. Owing to the loss of Persian subsidies and their own limited resources, it would be a tall task for the Spartans to maintain their fleet of 120 ships for an extended campaign. Despite his posturing, he knew that reality, and so he instead argued for a land campaign into Asia. No doubt, the recent success of the 10,000 was in the back of his mind. He had previously written letters to his old supporters in Asia, 
asking them specifically to request for Agesilaus to prosecute the war. They had obeyed and sent ambassadors to this meeting. It seems that the real reason for his involvement here was that he had hoped for himself to also to return to Asia, alongside Agesilaus. When back east, he could restore the Decarchii that he had established, but were abolished by the Ephors when decreeing that their city should be governed by their own ancestral laws. He likely approached Agesilaus with his plan before the meeting, and the two would have been in lockstep during it. In any case, a motion was put forth to relieve Dercilidus of his duties and to replace him with Agesilaus, though Dercilidus would be allowed to remain in an advisory capacity. When Agesilaus agreed to assemble and lead an expeditionary force, he claimed that he would not only protect the Asiatic Greeks, but wage an offensive campaign to avenge Xerxes' invasion a century earlier. Later events would prove that these lofty ambitions rose well above his capabilities. Still, the Spartans gave him everything he asked for in a six-month grain supply. And so, in the spring of 396 BC, he set out on this campaign with 2,000 Neodomides, or emancipated helots, and 6,000 allies. But Corinth, Thebes, and Athens refused to contribute any forces to this expedition. With the 7,300 troops that were already in Asia Minor, Agesilaus would have around 15,300 men at his disposal, more than double what Thibron and Dercilidus each commanded. For the first time, a Spartan general was leading troops sufficient enough for a major Asian campaign, though nowhere near enough to accomplish his goals. By his side would be 30 allotted Spartiates as an advisory council, including Lysander, Heripidus, and Dercilidus, all three veterans of Asian service. Unfortunately for Agesilus, though, this expedition got off to an inauspicious start. He chose to assemble his fleet from the Gerestos Promontory in Euboea, while he himself went across the strait to the Boeotian town of Aulis to make a sacrifice to Artemis, just as Agamemnon had when taking off for the Trojan War. Agesilus used that as propaganda for himself as the new Agamemnon, leading a Greek fleet against a barbarian one. He was trying to make a case for a pan-Hellenic motive for what was absolutely a strictly Spartan one, and was also trying to raise himself practically to a legendary level. He seems to have forgotten, though, what happened to Agamemnon upon his return from Troy. As we will see, he would receive almost as nasty a reception on his own return as had Agamemnon, though without the manslaying axe. More to the point, his estimation of his position is not only ridiculous, but arrogant and stupid. While Agamemnon had led the whole of Greece against Troy, Agesilaus mustered only a handful of men, and he hadn't accomplished anything to even merit the comparison to a Homeric hero. This would be the first of many public examples of the lack of judgment that marked Agesilaus' life and career. In any case, upon his arrival at Aulis, he ordered his own diviner to perform a sacrifice to Artemis. Instead of his own daughter, though, they chose a deer, an animal sacred to the goddess. However, the Boeotian priests, not Spartans, had the right to sacrifice on behalf of any suppliant at the sanctuary. But Agesilaus proceeded with his offering in defiance of the proper religious custom, which was either a calculated slight or an oversight. Either way, during the Peloponnesian War, a pro-Spartan party led by Leontiadus dominated Theban politics. But afterwards, the opposing faction grew into power. Led by Ismenius, they were often accused of atticizing, but were not, in fact, pro-Athenian. Still, they were very hostile to the Spartans. The climax came as the enraged anti-Spartan Boatarchoi responded to Agesilaus' fumbling at Aulis. As Agesilaus' people were setting up the altars for the sacrifices before they sailed off, the Theban cavalry just happened to arrive, and they knocked over all of the altars, ruining the sacrifices and told them to get out of Boeotia and not to come back again, grossly insulting Agesilaus and forcing him to leave Alice, but not in the grand way that he had imagined. This insult had an enormous impact on him, and he would be extremely hostile to Thebes for the rest of his life. And so, from the Gerestos Promontory in southern Euboea, Agesilaus and his forces unceremoniously sailed off to Asia. When they arrived at Ephesus, Tissaphernes was alarmed at the size of this new Spartan army. He immediately sent a messenger to ask Agesilaus why he was there with such a large army, as he and Dercilidus had already agreed to a truce. Agesilaus responded with his own message, that he was here because he didn't trust the satrap to abide by his promises, so he needed to ensure the Greek states in Asia would be autonomous. 
Tissaphernes thus asked for a new truce with the new Spartan commander, this one for three months, so that he could consult with Artaxerxes, and he promised to swear an oath to abide by the truce without deceit. Even though he was already aware of Tissaphernes' duplicitous nature, Agesilaus sent three emissaries, including Derkylidus, Heripidus, and Megillus, to ratify the truce. Unsurprisingly, Tissaphernes immediately proved himself to be a liar because instead of requesting peace from the Persian king, he asked for more forces to be sent to him immediately to deal with the new Spartan threat. Even though Agesilaus knew Tissaphernes was playing him false, he still continued to observe the truce, something Xenophon considered to be indicative of his honorable and pious personality. The truce, though, was entirely in Tissaphernes' favor and was a blunder on Agesilaus' part. For one, it forced Agesilaus to consume half of his six-month provisions of grain without accomplishing anything, and he wasted most of the campaigning season while his foe, without cost, bought time to build up his own army. Furthermore, it was urgent for them to strike before the Persian fleet, rapidly approaching completion, was put to sea. In order to combat the dwindling supply issues, Agesilaus had to plunder the Kaistros River Valley and then move on to Chaim. From there, he marched inland to western Phrygia before returning to Ephesus. It would seem then that the terms of the truce applied only to Tissaphernes' home state trap of Caria, and not to Aeolus and Phrygia. Agesilaus then spent the rest of the truce at Ephesus, knowing full well that he would confront Tissaphernes in the coming months. Ephesus at the time had neither a democracy, as under Athens, nor a decarchia, as under Lysander. Therefore, it suffered from political confusion and this was the state of affairs in most polis in Asia Minor. In this situation of turmoil, many people turned to the Spartans to solve their problems. But since everyone knew Lysander, and not Agesilaus, a huge mob continuously played court to him, so much so that it seemed like he had the power, while the king was just a figurehead. The other 29 Spartiates, who were serving as advisors, grew envious and considered this behavior arrogant and demeaning of royal authority. Soon, Agesilaus also grew angered and embarrassed by the attention shown to Lysander, and he began to ignore his counsel and to refuse all requests that came from his friends. Plutarch says that in judicial cases, all those who were anti-Lysander were sure to be victorious, while those who were his friends had to work extremely hard to escape being fined. Finally, Agesilaus offended him even more when he appointed Lysander as his carver of meats. Lysander, deeply pained, said, I see, Agesilaus, that you know very well how to humble your friends. To which Agesilaus responded, Yes, indeed, for those who wish to be more powerful than I am. And so, instead of just dismissing his advisor, he made a point of publicly snubbing him. Of course, field commanders have the right to maintain discipline among their ranks, but this rivalry interfered with his duties. He not only ignored the expertise of his most experienced advisor, but he angered Lysander's friends, who were prominent people in the Asiatic Greek cities, while he himself had no political plan to deal with the uncertain situation. Instead of taking advantage of the truce to settle Greek affairs to Sparta's advantage, he wasted it on a petty grievance. Lysander realized what was happening, was distressed by this dishonor, and solved the problem himself. He asked to be sent away so that he could be of service elsewhere, and Agesilaus gladly sent him to be an ambassador in the Hellespont region. There, he learned that some high-minded Persian man, with a lot of money, and 200 horsemen at his command, named Spiphrodates, had been slighted by Pharnabasus, and so he persuaded him to revolt against the king. If you remember from last episode, Spiphrodates had led a force of Pharnabasus' cavalry against Xenophon's retreating mercenaries at Calpe Harbor. Perhaps it was due to his defeat there that he was slighted by the satrap. In any case, Lysander, with Spithrodates, returned to Agesilaus, and he was so pleased by what Lysander had done that all was forgiven, at least according to Xenophon. The Oxyrhynchus historian's account of how Spithrodates came to Agesilaus does not mention Lysander at all, though. Regardless, Spithrodates' revolt had weakened Pharnabasus while establishing another Spartan foothold in the region. Without toil or expense, Lysander had done more damage to the Persians than Agesilaus had yet inflicted. Yet, Agesilaus made no further use of Lysander in the war, and so he eventually sailed back to Sparta. Back in mainland Greece, Agesilaus' slightly younger sister, the 44-year-old Kaniska, was having much better luck, as she became the first woman in history to breed horses and win at the Olympic Games. 
Women were only allowed to enter equestrian events, not by competing, but by owning and training horses. She had employed men and entered a team in the four-horse chariot racing event in the summer of 396 BC. Her team won, and as we have discussed before, it was the owner, not the rider, who won the prize. She would go on to win the same event four years later, too. According to Xenophon, she was encouraged to breed horses and compete in the games by her brother Agesilaus in an attempt to discredit the sport. He viewed success in chariot racing as a victory without merit, which was only a mark of wealth and lavishness due to the involvement of the horse's owner, while in the other events, the decisive factor was a man's bravery and virtue. By having a woman win, he hoped to show the sport to be unmanly. Kaniska's victories, though, not only did not stop wealthy Spartans from engaging in the sport, but had a great impact on the ancient Greek world as other women, not only Spartans, later won the equestrian events. However, none of them was more distinguished for their victories than she was. Kaniska was honored by having a bronze statue of herself in the Temple of Zeus in Olympia. The inscription on a remaining fragment of her marble statue base reads, quote, Kings of Sparta were my fathers and brothers. I, Kaniska, victorious at the chariot race with her swift-footed horses, erected this statue, end quote. Written in the first person, Kaniska clearly was willing to push herself forward and Xenophon says that this inscription was Agesilaus' idea. In addition to this, a hero shrine of Kaniska was erected in Sparta near the Platonistas, or Plain Tree Grove, where religious ceremonies and violent contests were held for boys aged 18 to 20, suggesting that as well as being celebrated among women, she was popular among men as well. Only Spartan kings were typically graced in this way, and Kaniska was the first woman to receive this honor. Upon her death, she was treated as a woman with heroic qualities, though not herself a bona fide heroine. Returning to Asia Minor, that summer, with his newfound army assembled, Tissaphernes now decided to openly show his deceit, and sent envoys to demand that Agesilaus withdraw from Asia, and that if he failed to do so, he would declare war. The allies were quite openly troubled, because in their judgment, the current force was very inferior to the resources of the Persians. But Agesilaus smiled and told the Persian envoys that he was quite grateful because by violating his oaths, Tissaphernes now had the gods as his enemies, and also had by the same action made the gods the allies of the Greeks. He then immediately ordered his soldiers to prepare for a campaign to Caria, and sent word to those cities along the way to send troops and prepare provisions for the Spartan army as it passed. Tissaphernes' strategy was to exploit his superiority in cavalry, as Agesilaus had none. Since Caria was unsuitable terrain for cavalry, he gathered his troops and led them towards the fertile Myandros River Valley, where his cavalry would be at an advantage. But instead of heading south, Agesilaus faked him out and went in the opposite direction to the north. His route probably took him as far as Pergamon, before going northeastward to the heart of Hellespontine Phrygia. Along the way, using the element of surprise, he marched almost unopposed and subdued the cities he came across by falling on them unexpectedly. As a result, he managed to take an enormous amount of booty. His advance was finally halted, near Daskalon, by some cavalry led by Rathene and Begaeus, the latter of whom was Pharnabasus' brother. Here, Agesilaus' cavalry was defeated in a minor skirmish, as his spears were inferior and shattered. The Persians managed to kill 12 men and two horses before the rest turned and fled. When Agesilaus' hoplite showed up, the Persian cavalry retreated. On the day after this cavalry engagement, when Agesilaus was sacrificing to the gods to see whether he should go forward, the liver of the victim was seen to have no lobe, a particularly bad omen, so they turned around and marched back to the sea. Even though Agesilaus made little progress in Hellespontine Phrygia, Pharnabasus still did not possess an army sufficient to defeat him. However, Agesilaus did seize a great deal of much-needed booty, and the standoff did buy him time to remedy his main tactical weakness. From this encounter, Agesilaus realized that he would never be able to offer battle in the plain without sufficient cavalry and weapons, something that should have been apparent years earlier. In any case, that winter of 396-395 BC, he began to compile a list of the wealthiest men in the Asiatic Greek cities and ordered them to provide horses. His requirements were swiftly met by announcing that whoever furnished a horse, weapons, and a suitable man for service would not himself have to serve. 
As a result, he now had a much-needed cavalry force to augment his hoplites, peltasts, archers, and javelin throwers, making this a far better balanced army than that of his predecessors. He also drilled his army and improved the equipment for all that winter. In accordance with Spartan customs, the rest of the 30 Spartiates who had been sent with Agesilaus had sailed home, and 30 new military officers were sent to replace them. From these, Xenocles was in charge of the cavalry, Scythes of the Neodomides, Heripidus of those who served with Kairos, and Migdon of the allied troops. Polis also arrived to replace Pharax as admiral of the fleet. While Agesilaus was laboring vainly in Asia, things began to turn against the Spartans on the sea. Not only did Conan have Persian support and the fleet back on Cyprus was nearly ready for action, but the Athenians were electrified. That's because once news of his royal appointment reached Athens, he became a beacon, attracting masses of unemployed but highly experienced Athenian rowers and sailors. Hundreds rallied to his distant banner, as the Athenians secretly supplied him with weapons and crews. They had also sent envoys to the king, presumably assuring him of their support against the Spartans. Such was the covert situation, until one Demonitus took matters into his own hands. According to the Oxyrhynchus historian, supposedly with the private blessing of the Athenian boule and its democratic leaders, he boldly commandeered a single public trireme to join Conan. When he was discovered and reported to Milan, the Spartan Harmost at Agina, the boule pretended to be ignorant by publicly disavowing the act and informing Milan that Demonitus had acted as a renegade. This small incident might seem more amusing than significant, were it not for the fact that Demonitus threatened to make public a clandestine Athenian policy. Only the quick action of Thrasybulus, Asimos, and Anitus prevented the situation from becoming a crisis. Yet the incident, for all of its melodrama, indicates that the Athenians had already prepared to translate their deep resentment against the Spartans into an active policy to topple them from power. Ship by ship, crew by crew, an Athenian navy in exile began assembling in the harbor of Cyprian Salamis. This was extremely important because the Cilicians and Phoenicians were slow to reach their quota for the king's ships. At the time, the Spartan fleet of 120 triremes was stationed on the important island of Rhodes and was now being commanded by Polis. Conan knew that, to have the greatest impact, he would need to dislodge them from Rhodes but he did not yet have his full Cypriot-built fleet, so he used strategy instead of force. Knowing that he could not assault Rhodes itself, Conan moved his fleet of 40 triremes from Cilicia to Caria and established his base of operations at the Carian city of Kaunos, which sat on the coastline a bit northeast across from Rhodes. Tactically, this site was an excellent choice for two reasons. First, it was the same base the Spartans had used almost two decades earlier when they took control of Rhodes, and secondly, it sat beside a river which gave Conan somewhere safe to anchor his ships if the position came under threat. Strategically, possession of this site acted as a gateway to the eastern Aegean from the eastern Mediterranean. North of it opened to Canidos, a city loyal to Persia, and the more powerful states of Samos, Chios, and Lesbos which looked to their own freedom rather than any friendship with Sparta. So Conan hoped to use both the king's patronage and Greek animosity towards Sparta to his advantage. Realizing this threat, according to Diodorus, that winter the Spartans had dispatched ambassadors to Neferitis, the current king of Egypt, to conclude an alliance. Instead of a treaty, though, he gifted the Spartans the material for a hundred triremes and some 500,000 measures of grain. Essentially, he was willing to help the Spartans, but not to the point of inviting immediate retaliation from Persia and risking his own throne. At the same time, Conan's gamble paid off as the Spartan admiral Polis mobilized all 120 ships, sailed out from Rhodes, and put in at Sassanda in Caria, a fortress not far from Conus. Using this as his base, he laid siege to Conus and blockaded Conan's smaller force. The siege lasted a few months with Conan being able to avoid direct combat with the superior numbers of Polis. But then, to their aid, a substantial reinforcement of 90 ships arrived, 10 from Cilicia and 80 from Phoenicia, under the command of the Lord of the Sidonians. And so Polis lifted the siege and sailed off to Rhodes with the entire fleet. Conan now had 130 ships under his command, 
and with them, he hoped to lure the Spartans to their defeat. Taking 80 triremes, he sailed to Lurima, a small peninsula on the mainland, immediately north of Rhodes. From there, he could see everything the Spartan fleet was doing, and his presence prompted a revolt there against the Spartans. Thinking that the Rhodians were also on the verge of revolt, Polus fled to Canidos with his entire fleet before it could be trapped and destroyed. The Rhodians then welcomed Conan into their city as a deliverer. The victorious Athenian admiral removed the oligarchic government that the Spartans had established, and in its place, there rose up a democracy hostile to Sparta. But quickly, a vicious counter-revolution arose. He avoided bloodshed by returning to Canis, but left affairs in the hands of his two chief subordinates, Hieronymus and Nicodemus. Now the Spartans, who were bringing the gift of grain from Egypt, were unaware of the recent defection of the Rhodians and approached the island in full confidence. But unfortunately for them, they sailed into the harbor and their ships, along with the grain, fell into the hands of Conan's forces. With all that grain now for the Rhodians, thanks to Conan, Rhodes remained loyal to Athens for the next few decades. This was a severe strategic blow for the Spartans, since the loss of Rhodes prevented them from organizing a combined land and naval attack on Tissaphernes and Caria, and threatened to disrupt communications between the land army in Asia Minor and the authorities back in Sparta. The victory also facilitated the joint operations of Conan's fleet with the contingents from Cilicia and Phoenicia. Following the Peloponnesian War, Sparta had enjoyed the support of nearly every mainland Greek state and the Persian Empire. But due to dissatisfaction with their imperialism, this solid base of support quickly fragmented. As things stood at the beginning of 395 BC, a Spartan king was leading an army into Asia against the Persians, but one that did not see the participation of Corinth, Thebes, or Athens, while an Athenian general in exile was at the head of a large Persian fleet. Later that year, Athens had seemingly recovered from its post-war troubles and allied with two former powerful enemies, Corinth and Thebes, and Sparta's longtime nemesis, Argos, to end Spartan hegemony over Greece. Backed by Persian money, they would open up a new theater by waging war on the Spartans in mainland Greece. We will even see Athens rebuilding its long walls and its fleet. The Greek world, once again being at war with itself, like nothing has changed, will be the topic of the next episode. So join me next time on the History of Ancient Greece, Episode 112, The Corinthian War. Mm-hmm.